Leads, leads, leads. What is happening? Welcome to Working Hours, a show about a place called Leeds, a time called now, and an activity called work. Working Hours wants to record 1,000 loiners over the course of this the most important decade in the history of the human species and ask them about what they do all day and hear how they feel about it. My name is Simon and this is all my fault. My mission here is to try to map out what my city, Leeds, a city that has declared a climate emergency, did during humanity's biggest emergency. On working hours we hear how loiners have, are and will be coping with our multiple and expanding crises during their day-to-day working hours. Can we turn things around? We'll find out. To tell this story I need loiners, loiners like you dear listener. I need people in Leeds or people from Leeds to come on this show and just tell me what they do and let me record how this decade affects us. Please do donate any amount you can to the Working Hours Project through PayPal or consider sustaining Working Hours with a regular £1 a month or more subscription on Patreon.com. Addresses for support are in the outro. This is intended as an expansive and expensive long-term project which I want to make available to anyone and I can only do that with your help. So if you can, please help. Thank you for listening. Right, so I'll kick off with the first question, which you know you know all these questions. I'll just remind myself. So the first oh, question yeah. is, what did you want to be when you grew up? Yes. The first question, yeah, sorry, I was busy reading it. Um, <laughs> um, well, I mean, I wanted to be all sorts of different things, really. Um, but I remember when I was quite little, wanting to be a vet me and my friend thought it'd be a great idea we had like loads of little soft toy animals that would carry around mm. and I and I'm pretty sure I got it from a tv program there was some sort of tv program on at the time that was about vets in a zoo and it was really it was on a Sunday afternoon not the Johnny Morris one I no it was, it was like a, it was a drama it was a drama and the the guy I remember the guy I think I had a bit of a crush on the main vet that's probably why as well this he is had, like, ringing vague bells. Yeah, he had like curly hair and it was all about like the ins and outs of what goes on in a zoo and the decisions they have to make and things like that. So it wasn't so much about yeah. animals. It was about that. I really love that programme. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, it can be really influential, can't it? Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I think I, I had ideas of all sorts of different things. And then because I always think I always try not to do this to kids when people say what do you want to be when you grow up because I just think Mm. it's such a huge philosophical question to ask a child it's Mm. like a lot of pressure Mm. because like even now I don't know what my ideal job would be I still don't know what I want to be when I grow Mm. up and I am Mm. a grown up Mm. (laughs) but um (laughs) yeah I went through a phase when I went to sixth form I was like because because we've never had any money in our family which is fine You you grow up with good values and how to survive um, but I thought, oh, I wonder what I wonder what job gets paid the most. There was like a directory at, at college where you can mm. look at all different jobs. So I just went through it looking for the one that was paid mm. the most. Mm. And it was a barrister's clerk. Mm. And I happened to know that there was a guy in my village who was a barrister. And at that point, I lived in like a little village in North Yorkshire. And mm. I knew this guy used to commute and go to Leeds, which seemed really glamorous to me. Mm. Because I'd not been to Leeds at that point. So I just went, I don't, I can't believe where I got my guts from, really. So I just went and knocked on his door in his posh house and introduced mm. myself and said, you know, I'd really like to learn about being a barrister. Can I come and do my work shadowing with you? And he's mm. like, yeah, of course you can, but you'll have to get yourself to Leeds. Because I think he lived in Leeds during the weekend. He, this was like his weekend mansion. Mm. So I was like, well, yeah, fine. And, and it was so funny because I can remember people at Sixth Farm, because I went to Sixth Farm in Scarborough, and people mm. were going, you can't travel to Leeds by yourself. It's really rough there. <laughs> people get held up by a knife point to steal the trainers. <laughs> That's what people thought. Like, well, to be fair, it was true. <laughs> probably, yeah, yeah. So anyway, I managed to, I think it was only for like, I think I did three days. So I managed to work out how to get to Leeds from where I was on the course liner and went to this proper, um, you know, like the inns, the court, the inns of court, is it called? Where you know where they are, they all have like their little offices where the, oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. The barristers yeah. work yeah and it was like walking into uh, like a Dickens novel I was like oh my god like yeah. it's so old fashioned and mm. be- everything made out of beautiful wood and it was just mm. amazing yeah um and I went with him 
uh, to see some of the cases that he was, because somebody was, I think somebody was prosecuting, somebody was defending. And it was fascinating. And he was a he was a really interesting guy, but it just made me realise this isn't a job for me. It's not like it's seen on TV, like a lot of mm. the, a lot of the court procedures were so long and drawn out and so like the bits you see on tv is like the drama of it but you don't Mm. see all the boring stuff that has to be done Mm. um and then also he was telling me about how he was defending well it it was basically a guy who was being accused of murdering children basically and he Mm. had to defend him and i was like well how do you feel about that and he's like well you know he hasn't told me that he's gilly but Mm. i feel that he's guilty but it's my job to defend him so unless he tells me any different that's you know people are obviously people are entitled to a fair defense which I I totally got but it made Mm. me sort of see the bigger picture and think about you know what is justice and Mm. and imagine if you were having to work your hardest to defend somebody that you knew in your heart of hearts was guilty of that offense how can you how do you manage to separate those two things? Mm. Um, yes, I quickly realised that, you know, yeah, you get paid a lot of money, but <laughs> it's not mm. worth it. Mm. But then you could say that until it's proven in the court, you mm-hmm. know, by the prosecution, we don't know they're guilty. Well, I think that's probably what he would have to tell himself to be able to do. I, I mean, that would have to be, the, yeah, because you. I mean, the thing is, it's faith in the law, isn't it? You you would have to have faith in the process that if my client is guilty, they should that you know they will and should go down for it. Yeah, but they still deserve the right to be protected. Oh, but... absolutely, yeah. And I did um I did AS level law, and I really enjoyed it. And I thought it was really interesting. But a lot of what you learn is that you know that I, I suppose it, I suppose it depends whether you agree there was a right outcome but mm. quite often the right outcome doesn't happen because of the way the law works and the way it's set yeah. out and you know it, it kind of you start sort of unraveling a huge hornet's nest of how mm. how systems and institutions work and mm-hmm. you know individuals against bigger organizations and I think mm. that was my first sort of opening into oh god the world the world is not that simple. Mm-hmm complicated nothing is black and white i think it's key there what you said about you know the kind of wood panel walls and stuff though you know like i went into i've been into the houses of parliament i went into Millbank and stuff and it's the same and public schools are the same mm-hmm. and then you go to like you know you go to a state school and it's all crumbling 70s plaster Concrete. and then you go to an office and it's crumbling 70s plaster <laughs> <laughs> yeah i absolutely agree yeah, yeah. But it was it was it was a really interesting experience. I'm really glad I did it because you could have ended up you could have ended up working your way towards working in law, and it might have took you quite a long time before you would actually come into contact with the real thing. Mm. It's a bit like um, so. I work on the MBCHB, which is basically the course to become a doctor, mm-hmm. and I think I don't know if it's the same anymore. But the University of Leeds used to be sort of highly venerated because we were one of the first universities to get students to have clinical encounters in the first year normally Mm -hmm. they wouldn't do anything until sort of second third year Mm -hmm. but actually it's really important to do that because a lot of people have an idea of what being a doctor is going to be like and they might have all of the grades and worked really hard but the reality of actually dealing with people yeah you know in those situations is completely different Mm -hmm. and so you know in general we don't don't have loads who leave in, in year one but you know we have a lot of people who just did not know that it was going to be like that Mm. Despite working all of the, you know, teenage years to to mm-hmm. get there, working mm-hmm. really hard, yeah, it's it's one of those jobs, you know, where you have to really. It's not about the money or the prestige, or it shouldn't be, because mm-hmm. you know, you you you're you've got people's lives in your hands, basically. Mm-hmm. Important. Mm-hmm. And the whole expectation versus reality thing—that's a big a big cause of misery for people, you know, from divorce rates through to like jobs and depression and on and on yeah um yeah but then uh, you know that goes back again to sort of the media that you consume they're the sort of things that give you the ideas of how things should be and how things are but then as you said you know you don't see the boring stuff because it's boring yeah. <laughs> who'd want to watch that it's yeah. like they'll switch over so it has to be exciting 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then, and then you're like, oh, that'll be an exciting job. And then you get the job and you're like, oh, it's not that exciting. Or it's really <laughs> dangerous. Or, oh, my God, I've got so much responsibility. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're listening to Series 4, Episode 8, and to my guest, Hazel Millichamp. This is another Zoom interview recorded on the 3rd of February, 2023. Hello. Hazel Millichamp is part of the Student Education Service in the University of Leeds Medical School. Having previously worked as a school business manager in a local primary school, Hazel started at the university providing maternity cover to finance and then moving into a student-facing role. She began as a year coordinator for year one and an ICU coordinator of year four. After COVID, there was a big student education service shakeup and roles changed. Hazel now works with year three and has been in the student education service for 10 years. Hazel is also a podcaster. Her excellent Leeds-based podcast, Light on Leeds, takes a look at the great and the good of Leeds and showcases some of the fascinating things people are doing in the world's best city. If for some reason you've not heard of Light on Leeds, go and check it out. It's a really good show. Hazel has been at this whole podcast thing longer than me and has many more episodes under her belt. So if you run short of Leeds podcast content, Hazel's got you covered. If you'd like to hear Hazel's work, go to lightonleeds.com or you can follow Light on Leeds at instagram.com forward slash light on leads, facebook.com forward slash light on leads, twitter.com forward slash leads underscore on. Follow, listen, share, guest, donate to podcasts you like. If you don't like this one, what are you doing here? Turn it off. Please join me on Patreon or Ko-fi to provide monthly support or help the show with a donation. Demonstrate your support for this show on social with likes, follows and shares. If you want to keep listening to interviews such as these, then you will need to do something to help facilitate that because I'm all spent up now. Share and recommend working hours wherever and whenever you can. Right, let's do this. Episode 88 of Working Hours with Hazel Millichamp. Okay, so we're on to what you're doing now. So um, you're not just doing that. Obviously, you also run the Light on Leeds podcast. That's right. How many years has that been going now then? I will be hitting my four-year birthday at the end of May. Only four years? I thought you'd been yeah. going longer than four. No, four years. I, I'm, I'm, quite, I'm proud that it's kept going that long. Yeah, that's hard work. I mean, you've, I mean, you've been working full-time as well the whole time. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I squash all of my hours into four days. Mm. So I'm, I work full time, but I just mm. make my working day longer and my dinner hours shorter um, mm. so that I can have Fridays off, which, which is a good thing about working at the University of Leeds, that they're mm. good about flexible working. Mm. Um, you know, I, I, it's dependent on your role and things. But yeah, it's good that mm. you can have a different kind of model to work with. Yeah. Um, and then it leaves Fridays for me to do podcast stuff, but then also... Just to be, because my job is in, I suppose it depends on what you define as creative, but my job is not particularly creative. It's not in any way artistic. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's nice to be able to have time to follow more artistic things that I like to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it helps because I think if I just did my job, mm-hmm. I, I would not be a fulfilled person. Mm-hmm. Like I, I love the role and I love what I do and I love the team of people that I work with, but it's very repetitive because obviously, yeah. you know, academic years just roll over and you feel like you're seeing the same things happen again and again. And it yeah, can yeah. be, you know, it can feel a little, um, I don't know, restricted. So it's nice to be able to have time to do other things that are nothing to do with administration or Excel spreadsheets. Mm. <laughs> are you what are you on a permanent contract? Yes, I yeah. am. I'm one of the lucky ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I was going to say, like, yeah. Because if you were on a sort of rotating year by year, I, I think that would definitely add more pressure to it as well. Because you're kind of like, hmm, I don't know what I can do from here. Yeah. yeah, I think it would be difficult for them to do that with the, with this particular part of the university because it's the kind of thing where 
you have to sort of see quite a few cycles through to to get to grips yeah. with it really if you know and what you i mean need so to be able to plan and yeah. you know, like yeah. you need someone that's up to speed to be yeah 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 so i, I mean but you know that still doesn't leave you not at risk does it oh no it's, you know I, the, the can and will kind of get rid of everybody yeah um yeah Take us through the story of kind of going into the the job and then, um, yeah, like starting the podcast and sort of how that journey's been. Yeah, so I've worked in the school education service for 10 years, but uh, my first role at the university was covering a maternity. So it was like, it was a finance role and I absolutely hate maths. But because I'd been a school business manager previously and you're looking after a budget and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I sort of fit the bill. And um, I don't know if anyone's ever applied to university leads, but the application process is so mm. awful. Like the questions mm. that they ask you are really in depth and quite often they repeat themselves, but you have to give different examples. Mm. So I was quite lucky to get in there really in the first place. And then they kept me on after my uh, contract ran over. And then I think I'd worked there long enough that I could go on to deployment which mm-hmm. is, you know, you get sort of first dibs at jobs, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I moved over to staff development, covering another, it was covering a long-term sick. But it was quite a good way in, really, because I got to s- sort of navigate my way through quite a lot of university systems and things in a short amount yeah. of time, so yeah. I could build up experience. And yeah. then I decided that I would like to do a student-facing role. Um, and so I applied for this role that I'm in now. And at first I was a coordinator for year one, and part of year four and I just sort of got into the groove of it really and uh yeah the first couple of years were fantastic uh and I just really enjoyed learning all of these new systems and mm. there's a lot of acronyms at the university anyway but then when you add in the medical school it's like even worse mm. um and I got involved with a team running the they're called OSCEs um I've had to I've had to bring it up because I'll I'll never remember what it stands for or objective structured clinical exams so it's a it, when, you, when you try and describe it to people it's a bit like speed dating so mm. there's all these little cubicles mm. and students will have to go in they have a certain amount of time there'll be somebody in there examining them who will be a consultant who's a specialist in that area and sometimes mm. there's a simulated patient who's like an actor who mm. has to pretend to be the patient and then yeah. they have a certain amount of time and then they rotate all the way around um, so I used to be involved in um, setting that up with a team of people and it was a lot of work and we'd start planning in probably November and the exam wouldn't be until June. But that's mm. how long it took to, to mm. get, you know, just the logistics of getting. Yeah. It, it used to be, I don't know if it still is, but it used to be the longest running single site medical exam in Europe. And it was such hard work and it took months and months. But on the day when everything was all set up and everything was all ready to go, and I would have an air horn to start it so everyone could hear. <laughs> <laughs> it was just, you just look around like, oh my God, I can't believe I did this. And it would like last yeah. for two days yeah. and then take everything back down and uh, have have like a month's rest and then yeah. and then get ready to do it all again for the next year. So I used to, I really enjoyed being part of that. Mm. Yeah. But that, but things have kind of changed now. They've had a big shake up um, in the Like killed off by COVID or? Uh, well, I think we're moving towards, I think people realise that it was kind of like an exam that was run on goodwill in many ways. Mm. Uh, like you you ended up sort of being funnelled into being part of this team, but mm. it wasn't, for example, say, I don't know, five members of staff left suddenly. Mm. There was no kind of um, route for other people to be able to take it up. And I think people realised that, that, we needed to be um, more sort of organised mm. uh, about, about the approach. So mm. now there's a, a whole assessments team. So I'm still involved in the exams, but I used to be involved in every aspect of them, which mm-hmm. is not very sustainable because if one mm. person's taken out, then that's yeah. it. Yeah. So I get, I get why we're doing it, but it's just not as much fun because, uh, yeah. you know, I, I still take part in them and have little roles, but occasionally I'm like, I look at it, I think, oh God, we used, we used to do all of this. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah. So take us to take us into the podcast. Tell us uh, starting yes. that up. And like, I mean, how hard was it at the beginning? Like was 
did you just have say 20 mates who'd agreed and you just went let's go I just didn't it. I just didn't put much thought into it I just didn't think it. about it and then you <laughs> yeah. by accident four years yeah. in and then as things were going I was like oh I should have thought about that I should have thought about <laughs> that and then I just had to like do it as it came along um so I I think it was in 2018 I just I just felt like like my son had left home and um, I was bored at work and um, I just decided, you know what, I'd quite like to have an adventure. Mm. And somebody, I don't even know who that person is anymore, but somebody got in touch with me on Facebook and offered me a job teaching English in, uh, I think it was like Dubai or somewhere like that. Mm. And I've never thought about that before. And I was like, oh, that would be quite interesting. And I mentioned it to my son more of as a, you know, I could never do that. And he was like, well, well, why couldn't you? You know what I mean? You've been looking for something to do. So I um, got myself on a TEFL course, it took me a year and passed that. And then I just thought, you know what, I'm going to apply for leave from work. And mm-hmm. luckily for me, it used to be that like academics would kind of get those, be allowed those opportunities. And then I think the university realised that, you, you know, everybody should be allowed to have the same opportunities. Mm-hmm. Um, and so my line manager, who's lovely, applied for it on my behalf and I said yeah you can have a year so then Mm. I then I just looked for because I needed to keep my house I rent my house but I needed to keep it going I needed to have somewhere to come back so it it had to be somewhere I wanted somewhere completely different I wanted it to be like a big culture change but I needed it to pay well (laughs) as well um so anyway I ended up looking at loads of different countries nearly went to South Korea but I ended up choosing Taiwan so I went to Taiwan and it was amazing. It was just like such a great experience. Um, the kids were uh, just fantastic. And I had to think on my feet all the time. Like every day was an adventure. I loved it. Um, and then I had to come back five months in. I'm not going to go into details, but it was to do with something with the family. Um, so I ended up having to come back earlier than I would have liked to have done. Mm. And then when I came back, I managed to get my role back, which was really lucky because um, mm. someone just happened to be leaving who'd been covering my role. So all worked out um but then I was like oh I'm just it's gonna depress me just you know the fact that I had to come back mm. and now I'm straight into this boring you know travel come down yeah, yeah. Um, and it's and harsh that, as well because it's England so it's like it's grey it's wet everybody's moaning there's no night markets here yeah <laughs> no, there's yeah. no lights on at night it's just <laughs> cold and traffic and yeah yeah, yeah. so um I decided I needed to do something and I think it was about that time that I managed to get squashed my hours second off Fridays off and I thought well I don't want to just waste having that day off and my partner at the time had a recording studio and had spent a lot of money and time like years on this project Mm. and I was like you know I should surely be able to get something out of it (laughs) Mm. so then then also I've always liked podcasts since the first existed and Mm. my uh I think of him as my pod father, Adam Buxton. Loved Adam Buxton and thought he was great. And I just thought, you know what? I I think I could do that. And then I thought, well, what would it be about? And I thought, well, I'm always going on about leads to people all the time. And I know there's so many great things that go on in the city. And also you feel like Leeds just doesn't shout about itself the same way as Liverpool and Manchester do. It doesn't seem to have that sort of identity, even though it should have, because there's loads Mm. of things that started Mm. here or that happened here. So yeah, decided to do that. And then I thought I want to keep it basic. So mm. I decided to stick to the three questions that are just dead easy. And at first, and I knew I wanted it, I wanted it to be about the brilliant people in Leeds and the great things they're doing. Mm. And at first, it was people in South Leeds that I'd had things to do with because mm. um I've written for South Leeds Life and yeah. thought I know the editor and then just loads of people round about that I know yeah. are doing great things. And then I worried that I might run out of things, but it's kind of been organic. So Mm. eventually people come to you with ideas or or previous. I always say to anyone, you know, I'm always open to suggestions. Mm. Um, So, yeah, it's just it's just carried on and on. And then also. um, So when I split with my partner, I was a bit like, oh, well, that's it. I mean, but then I thought, no, I want to keep going. So mm. I taught myself how to record. I taught because I used to do all the editing and things like that. I used to take ages mm. as well because music producers just want everything perfect. And <laughs> podcasts do not need to be perfect. It's You're compressing it things. all down anyway into a tiny file. So it's like it just doesn't, it just yeah. doesn't matter. Um, and so at first, 
I had all the people used to edit the podcast for me. Um, like people who've been get all for free, which is really nice because I don't mm. make any money off the podcast. It costs me money to make it. Mm. I just see it as an expensive hobby, really. And then during COVID, it got more difficult to, mm. to have anybody who could help because it, because it, life was just crazy for everybody. Mm. Um, and so I thought, you know what? I'm just going to, you can, if, if you can watch YouTube, you can learn how to do anything. So mm. that's what I did. And then I got Audacity. And the first time I edited a podcast, I was like, that took me like, that took me less than 20 minutes. <laughs> it used to take these people days. Like, what were they doing? <laughs> um, but what, and the other thing is, is that during COVID, it was lovely for me personally, just to be able to speak to usually two or more people a week yeah. who were doing really inspirational yeah. things, like really good, feel good things. Yeah. That was, that was for my mental health was brilliant. And also mm. to have a focus, you know, something that you that you're working on all the time. Something to hang on to, yeah. It, yeah. It's like in the sort of, I think I, I I described it before on the podcast. It's sort of like being in a blizzard, and you need those those you know those sticks in the in the white out to be able to see yeah. your way through. Yeah. 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 So I just I love it. I love doing it, and yeah, I got a lot of joy out of it. And I think one of the things that's great is because there's been there's been points where I've thought about trying to make money out of it. And I mm. had somebody, I think I asked your advice about it. I had somebody mm. sort of, it turns out it was a lot of crap. I thought when anything's too good to be true, yeah. It's, yeah, it's never, yeah. you know, I mean, but I got right excited. Yeah. But, um, I, but actually, one of the things that I think I think it helps that I don't worry about the money because mm. because it's it's just always enjoyable to me. And then like say, you know, like I had my mum died at the end of August, which was obviously awful. Mm. And I was able to just um, leave the podcast for a bit until I was ready to do it again. Uh, whereas I think if I worried about money or felt like I was having to keep something up. For yeah, people, if it was dependent, you're like income dependent. It's like, yeah, I've yeah. got to do it. because Yeah, that would have been a lot. How am I going to my money? Yeah. Yeah. So, so and I think as well as a thing about, I mean, it, it's great to earn money off something that you love doing. But there's always a risk that you take something that you really enjoy and mm. the pressures of trying to make money out of it kind of take mm. the joy away from it. Mm. So, I mean, not that I'm going to, if somebody wants to come and give me £100,000 for all of the work I've done over four years, I, I'll mm. gladly take it. But mm-hmm. um, for now, I'm just, I don't worry about it really. And, and then also it's nice to hear, it's nice to sort of look at statistics and things like that, but I don't have to worry about it too much. Mm. And I like I like it that way. Mm. Well, you're doing it right. I'm doing all the opposite of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I totally get, I totally get, <laughs> you know, I totally get um, that people need to make money. And um, and especially, I think, for smaller independent people, I, I think one of the annoying things for me is, is that I feel like I started podcasting before it became huge. And mm. now it's like every famous person has at least four mm. different bloody podcasts, which mm. are great. You know, I listen to some of them and they're brilliant, mm. but it's annoying because it's like, well, you already made money out of it. Yeah. Can you just yeah. podcasting for us? But then you have to think of them as like, in a way, the thing that supports the rest of the ecosystem and then allows you to be discovered, you know, like they potentially bring people into podcasting and then they look for other stuff and hopefully find you it's yeah, but I suppose, yeah it would I suppose, feel like there was more space if they weren't clomping around in their big bbc boots and stuff yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly and and it's a bit like um i suppose one of the good things is when i first started podcasting quite often people had never heard of a podcast and then mm. you have to try and find a way of describing what it is which is mm. quite you know it, because it's not it's not a radio program it's quite casual Mm. And, and it's definitely one of the things that I enjoy about listening to podcasts is I feel like it's way more, it feels more like an intimate experience than listening mm. to a radio show, for example. Mm. And I like the difference between obviously like, you know, a program on Radio 4 has been beautifully produced, directed, edited, you know, sound and mm. it's perfect because mm. it's a, it's a, a proper production. Whereas mm. I feel like I, I, what I like about a podcast is that it, it feels quite crafty and mm. you know, like if you hear a siren going by in the background, I actually mm. gonna like that because I mm. think it it kind of grounds it in 
reality you know this yeah. is just a conversation between two yeah. people and you feel like in a way you've been privileged to like eavesdrop in a way yeah it's like someone's... earwigging on the bus or the train or something of like yeah. oh, i've just been listening to these people for two and a half hours it's been really interesting <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like it's like the sonic equivalent of people watching i suppose you could say yeah yeah i i've had one on today it was um it was some ecological podcast and it was an American one and it was really overproduced. There was like music through all of it. And then they were cutting out, like cutting away from the interview with, with the guest to have the presenters say what they said. Just oh. let them say what they said. <laughs> like, I don't want to hear you <laughs> telling me what they said. You You've got it recorded. It. Let me yeah. listen to it. <laughs> um yeah was, I, I couldn't listen to it it was too annoying I turned it off I turned off a movie trailer the other day because it was just I can't watch this anymore because the, they're all just done to the same rhythm now and I could tell from the film you know like from the bits that they were showing I was like this isn't you're not advertising the film that this is you're just doing a movie trailer <laughs> like you've just that do you know what I mean yeah I do know what you mean yeah I do I think it's just really fascinating and I think I love like the diversity of podcasts so I have one that I listen to on a night not I don't even have any trouble sleeping but I read about it in the garden I thought oh that sounds really good and I love it and it's called boring boring bedtime stories boring bedtime stories something like that it, mm. I, I should know because I listen to it every single night but it's great <laughs> and so it's just like it's just like an American woman reading books that are like out of print yeah. but a f- like just really sometimes I worry this is going to be so interesting I'm not going to be able to get to sleep but literally I'm gone in like less than 10 minutes so sometimes <laughs> I have to listen to them during the day just because the, they are actually dead interesting to me and yeah. um, I, I just love the fact that there's so many you know and I um there's one called you must remember this which is mm. about the golden age of Hollywood mm. um and that's fantastic I just like that you 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 could be interested in the most obscure thing mm. but you'll find a podcast about it and I like that Mm. they're a bit like I mean they're kind of like zines as well aren't they like or do you remember those you'd get those magazines which would have a cassette tape on with a story yeah I used to love those yeah Yeah. (laughs) 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 that's what we had to make do for entertainment before the internet and like so I did I was doing a house clearance for my uncle uh, who passed last year and yeah he had so much crap but like all these books and stuff and all these like weird books and like stuff that was ordered or bought in strange little bookshops and it was like that that was what content was then it was just like all these weird books on weird things and how to do things and you know which are basically just youtube channels now you know like I, i remember i had a partner who was working in the internet the early early days of the internet and one of her colleagues who'd been asked to describe what the internet was it said do you know what teletext is and they went yeah and said it's that with better graphics <laughs> <laughs> that's a really good description I can remember I went the first time I went to university I was doing I did a media course and it was just as the internet was becoming a thing that we could all use and I can remember the tutor saying like you really and we I think it was the first time that they'd given out like email addresses for the internet sort of system and things. Mm. And he was like, you've really got to get into the internet. He was like, I know at the minute it seems a bit of like a wild west. And at that point you had to be careful what time you went on. You had to avoid going on when America was awake. Otherwise you just wouldn't get on. Which seems like so crazy now. Like I feel like a dinosaur saying that, but Mm. it's true. And um, yeah, he was saying you really need to like get into the internet because it's going to be everything. And like, Mm. I remember that now because I'm like, God, yeah, like couldn't have been more correct like Mm. it's everything and I think I think we're living in a really strange time where I don't know sure people have thought this through the ages but it just feels like in my lifetime and Mm. even in my son's lifetime he's 24 so much stuff has happened so Mm. like like I feel like I feel like with the internet in a way we're in this situation where we're in it happening still it's, it's still relatively new Mm. Uh, in the grand scheme of things and I feel like you know like obviously there there are great things about the internet that are really positive and brilliant and fantastic but there's Mm. also same as humanity you know I mean there's also this awful dark horrible side Mm. and I feel like in a way we're not in a position to judge yet 
because mm. we're because we're still so in it. Like it'll mm. be really interesting to sort of be 20, in 20, 30 years time, look back and have like a, a bigger scale to, to look mm. at what the impacts of it are. Mm. But yeah, it's fascinating stuff. But yeah, I, I love the internet just because I love random information and just being able to look up anything you want, you mm. know. My uh, mm. I love my sister's pieces, but she drives me nuts because she puts I'm not I'm not on Facebook anymore, but she when I was she driving nuts because she put things like, does anybody know when Greg's is open? It's like <laughs> Yes, the internet go. does. Look at it. <laughs> like you can't you kind of feel like there's no excuse for anyone not to know anything anymore. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Because the, mm. the information is there for you just need to find it. Mm. But then Which again, is... the, the opposite side of that, of course, is checking your sources. Mm. That that's the that's the downside. You know what I mean? You need to you need to be aware who's posting and why. Mm. Mm. But then even with that, you know, that can be a rabbit hole. So yeah. um yeah. And and I like I think it's just it's it's really difficult to navigate now. Yeah. Um, I think it is. And I think um social media is a bit of a hornet's nest. And mm. I think again, we're not in a position to really be able to stand back and make a judgment on anything. And um for me personally. I used to be, I used to be massively into posting on everything on every social media network that there is. Do you know what I mean? Mm. But I've found for me personally in the last couple of years, um, I prefer not to have anything to do with it, and I feel mm. better for it. I completely understand why people enjoy it, mm. and I understand my own reasons for enjoying it at the time. But mm. I just don't feel like I, I need it anymore. Mm. I don't, I, I find it just, I, I think it kind of sucks air out of everything. And, mm. you know, you end up being obsessed with it and um, have, a, you know, I, I don't have notifications on anything because I can't stand that. It, yeah. it feels like a stress to me. Yeah. And like my family are in like family WhatsApp groups and stuff. I can't, my worst thing as well is if somebody on bloody messenger adds me to a group, I don't understand how. You're not allowed. You should. You should be asked permission. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and then all of a sudden you've been dragged into this group. Then you feel rude for leaving. So I feel like I have to text the person and say, "I'm really sorry, but I never I can't, feel rude, I can't rude be in public social media." <laughs> no, it's just not for me. I don't. I don't want it. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm all over the. I'm not. I'm not being disciplined on this at all, am I? Um, <laughs> That's fine. But I think it's all. Yeah, I think it's all good chatter. Let's do. Let's continue on with this on social media on the social media front. I mean, do you have to do any social media for your other work? No, I don't. No. Um, I don't have. There's a whole. There's a whole team of people in each school that that takes care of that. I've often thought it'd be quite an interesting job to do because I do like. I do like creating content and mm. think I'm good with words and I and mm. I and I like taking photographs. Your posts you know, are good. I've, I've noticed a good few of your posts coming up. I really report. enjoy I really enjoy the actual I enjoy the making of them, but I don't yes. enjoy the then sharing and then remembering mm. to tag everyone. And mm. and also what I tend to do is because it just takes so much time, I do one <laughs> lot of advertising for each episode and that's it whereas yeah. I think other people would just like keep sharing and try to keep it in people's minds I just can't be asked and like, I've often thought it would be great to have um if, if I had any money and I could afford to pay somebody else mm. a, a young person to come and do all the social media because mm. you know like uh I think it was um I don't know if you know Debbie from that leads mag um but she's great yeah yeah yeah. And yeah. she was telling me, like, she listens to podcasts about Instagram and, you know, how to use social media, because obviously it's her business. Mm. Um, and she was saying to me, oh, you know, people don't really, because I find it hard to advertise on Instagram, because mm. how do you advertise a podcast? But mm. then she was like, oh, um, you should check out stories, which I've never bothered with. Um, mm. And she's like, Cause, because there's some research that shows people tend to notice that more than actual posts. Mm. Some, some mm-hmm. people only look at stories. Yeah, yeah. So then I found like a free, some sort of free software that came on my laptop. Um, and so, yeah, I make reels and things like that. But I, I really enjoy doing that. Mm. But I just don't like having to, you know, share it to Twitter. Then. And I always feel like, as well, I know some people do like a thing where they'll just send the same thing out on every platform but I think mm. 
I think there is like a slightly different audience on each one yeah, of them. I agree. Yeah. So I haven't personally posted on um apart from when I had to do stuff to do with funerals and stuff um on Facebook since uh I think it was a year in November. Mm. But I keep it open for light on leads. So I'll post on there just because some people that's for some yeah. people Facebook is the internet. Yeah. Um, yeah. But to be honest, when I look at statistics and things like that. I mean, I can't really say that it makes that much of a difference. No, but you never know either. But then the other thing is like, well, do you need them? You know, like if people are going to find you, are they going to find you anyway? I mean, yeah. but then you think of your own experience of finding things. It's like some stuff you come across, you're like, why have I not come across this? Like I, I've just found a YouTuber today who's based in Leeds. It's a, I've come through a bunch of theology channels to her and she's like based in Leeds um so I've obviously you know sent her a message yeah. but it's it's like the kind of thing I should have seen ages ago or known mm. about or come across somewhere else you know like because I'm doing lots of lead stuff I thought that you know you'd imagine it would come up yeah yeah, yeah. but it's like but then you you happen across them when you happen across them as well exactly and, and also I know for me personally like I, I'm I'm more of a lurker really um I don't really post stuff per se on mm. Twitter but mm. I actually find Twitter and Instagram for me really useful for finding guests. So, yeah. So, to some extent, it must work. You know, yeah. I mean, like, you know, so I, I imagine that I occasionally must get, but then, then you think it's it's that thing, isn't it? It's like quite often I'll have scrolled through something and I might see like a podcast that I think is interesting, but then I forget because I've got like a million other things that are going on. And then you might see another post and it just reminds you that, oh, yeah, actually, I've got a couple of minutes. I'll, I'm going to go and listen to that now. Mm. So, I think I, I'm, I'm sure it works in that sort of organic way to some extent but mm. but like I said because I, because I don't make any money out of it I don't feel pressured to have to yeah. care about it that much yeah which is useful yeah and it's it, it's a good show it's a really good show thank, uh, you, tell us about, thank you um yeah let's pat each other on the back <laughs> <laughs> um yeah tell me about the, the theme music um well I don't know if anybody's ever listened to Adam Buxton's podcast, but he does great little stings, mm. like great little um, sort of, like his, his kind of break is up, don't they? And, and yeah. they're all in, they're all slightly tongue-in-cheek and silly and um, quite catchy. So, he is genius like, level at that. He is like, you know, like he's a genius yeah. level jingle creator. So great. And some of them are so funny and you get them stuck in your head. Um, so I wanted something like that, and like I said to you, because so I thought, oh, I'm going to make a podcast. So then I had my first, like I had my first guest, done it, we'll have edited it all together, and then I was like, I don't have a theme tune, and because we had the recording studio, and um, Will's a music- musician, and um, a lovely girl called Jess was part of this whole thing we're all involved in. She's a brilliant singer, so I, I said to Will, like, I, I want it to sound like like an Adam Buxton thing, like just silly, stupid, like, you know, just silly, basically. <laughs> and then, and then just like, well, you're going to have to write me some words. Cause like I'm a singer, but I don't write words. So then right. I, so, I mean, I mean, it's silly and I'm um, just basic, but that's all I wanted. So yeah. we just quickly made it. I think it took like, I don't know, five minutes or something uh, because, because I didn't realize I needed one until I was going to publish yeah. it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. then I was like, how do you even publish a podcast? I didn't even yeah. thought of that. So then I had to do like a bit of research and find something, pay for it. So yeah, that's how the theme tune came about. But I, I love the theme tune. It's it's daft. But what I really like is this doesn't happen very often, but when it happens, it's just so great. Like occasionally someone goes, Oh, I listen to your podcast. I go, I love these lollies. What's up there? <laughs> <laughs> and, they're, and they're like, I'm just getting it stuck in my head. And I'm like, oh yeah. my god, I like that I it think is did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah just silly silliness but yeah I really like it and, and also I did think for a bit about changing it up but mm. it's too late now it's just part of the podcast it's never going to get changed it'll stay like that forever <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to take my phone because I don't know if I turn it on uh, to silent or not um no I didn't <laughs> Because I was like, if I haven't, it's bound to ring. Um, <laughs> okay, so let's talk about Brexit. Oh. Um, we can keep it short um, <laughs> if you want, uh, <laughs> or at least I'll try. I'll try not to extend it. 
Um, it's nice actually to be able to talk politics ish mm. on the on the it's story. work related <laughs> yeah yeah but i think it, it's nice because i've tried to uh, i mean i think it probably comes across where my sensibilities are to be honest but because it's a podcast about leads like i don't feel like it's my place to be uh, particularly political if you see what i mean because yeah. like, if you try to represent everyone then you yeah. don't want to be you know mm. i'm sure it must come across anyway but mm. you know ostensibly it's not a political podcast um mm. But yeah, Brexit, God. It's where it all started to go wrong, isn't it? Like, like, like to me, that like I remember thinking about Brexit and thinking, oh no, like definitely that's this definitely, century, that's definitely right, not gonna yeah. happen. We like, had the millennial bug going into it, and then we had the dot-com crash, and we had uh Banking. George W. Bush election, and then we had Iraq, <laughs> then we had the the credit crunch, then we had <laughs> Trump and Brexit. Oh God! And then we had this decade start and COVID. So yeah, it's killer bees next. That's what we're getting next. Killer bees. Uh, it would be zombies, like literal zombies. That'd be, like that'd flying be nice. space zombies on broomsticks. I think a lot of people <laughs> would enjoy zombies. <laughs> well, that, I think that's it. That, that's what we're actually hoping for. Is we, we hope for Mad Max. But the reality of a Mad Max, like it seems more exciting, but the reality would just be like, you know, death by toothache and awfulness. And... Yeah, death by toothache, <laughs> yeah, definitely, 100%. Like absolute boredom for hours and just constant pain. Yeah. Um, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Brexit, how does oh, that face up? God, Brexit. <laughs> uh, it's really difficult, isn't it? I think one of the things I learned about was um, at the time before the vote, I had a colleague who um, she was just coming up to retirement age and I didn't know a lot about why we got into the European Union in the first place. Like, mm. like for me, I saw it as kind of like an ideological thing. Like I know people are like, oh, there's so much corruption and, you know, it's not as great as it seems. And But I thought, yeah, but isn't the idea that we don't want there to be a world war ever again? Mm. And it's kind of like, even if the system's not perfect, mm. isn't it about kind of like solidarity do you know what I mean like I, I mm. and I hated the whole immigration rhetoric side of it like I mm. just don't I mean I know I know it's ridiculous and you know people go oh, of course you couldn't do that that's too idealistic but as far as I'm concerned mm. somebody gets in a bloody dinghy to make the way across the sea with their children and facing death mm. then do you know what I mean let them stay here like you know I don't care if I get anything a little bit less because somebody else gets some help Mm. And I just think, and I hated that whole, I hated that whole feeling about it, you know, and, and thinking about what, like, if you were, if you were here from I don't know, Eastern Europe or something, that must have been, that must have left a nasty taste in your mouth, you know, to be in a country where the conversation was the way it was and, mm. you know, not to take mm. it personally must have been very difficult. Mm. Um, but yeah, I just think it was just. It was just a massive shit show, really. And mm. what I don't understand is, as well is, why isn't why isn't there like um you know like a truth council in situations like that? So so quite often you had one side using a set of figures to to back up one opinion, and then mm. the other side would use the same set of figures to back up a completely different outcome. Mm. And I felt like there was no there was no way you could look to get mm. information that wasn't kind of partisan on one side or the other. Mm. I think, and I think, I don't know. And, I, and then, the, other, the, the, the other thing was they had it at, I mean, there's a million things, but they also had it at a time when, you know, since the, the crash, which is like, for me, that's the, Iraq was a major crime that, you know, loads of implications for everything else and, and, and the dot-com, boom leading up to the credit crunch but like after that that just total bailout no one going to jail um and then just I, i've lost my thread here what what am i what were you on we're on brexit, brexit. yeah they're like so the eu doing that you know like they fired the prime minister in italy they you know put just put somebody in they absolutely crushed greece you know wow. like so why would anyone have any faith in them? Like even as a as a Remainer, but like it was it was 
and I've said this before, you know, with that vote, the only people that were going to come out to vote were people who wanted to leave because that's the way those kind of referendums work. Yeah. You know, most people vote to keep these things the same unless there's, you know, and they've said that that was an austerity vote. There's a, like a million things in with it. But uh, yeah, the, the the EU didn't help. Oh, no, like, they gave not. Cause, They gave enough cause and demonstrable cause, like, Oh, absolutely, you know. absolutely. And also when my friend Jane uh, explained to me like w- what it was like at the time when we when they voted to be in the union uh, and what they thought they were voting for mm. turned out not to be that uh, and mm. was, com- you know, had completely warped and changed mm-hmm. into something. The relationship was comp- not what anyone had expected or voted for at the time. Mm. So I thought that was really useful to be able to hear another person's view of it and and for it not to be to not be to be about immigration or racism it was yeah. about you know yeah, I, I just thought it was, but I, but rather I feel than like, a scapegoat but why wasn't there enough why why was nobody giving us a clear historic like this is how it happened this is why these people are angry about it this is why these people want this there was there was no sort of um rational objective view given mm. to anyone mm. at all yeah I just think it was about it's, it's just about so many things and, and I just felt really cross as well because it kind of felt like it was really difficult at that point I was quite into the Labour Party I'm not so much anymore but uh it was difficult because like I really liked Jeremy Carbon. I thought he was I thought he was mm. a great I mean obviously he's got his problems um but I thought at the time it was great and and there was no it didn't feel like I, I totally understand why he he mm. didn't want to be uh, remain and I, and I understand that and, and in a way I really admired the fact that he stuck by his principles even though really the country needed somebody against the conservatives although I know I know that they weren't all it wasn't just partisan but it felt it did feel like that mm. and um, yeah I feel like there was no. I don't know, there just didn't feel to be any direction or anyone. Mm. I don't know. I think I just think the whole thing was really messy and horrible. And it felt like it wasn't about the things that people thought it was about. So I I was in Brazil as it had sort of kicked off the campaigning and stuff proper here. And I got back and I remember I met my parents at the airport and they were just like, it's just awful. It's just awful. It's everywhere. It's all the time. It's just awful. Both sides are awful. It's really awful. <laughs> yeah, it was horrible. And then when after the vote, and then it was like deadly quiet. And you know, that thing that I've said of like, you know, everything has changed, everything's completely changed. And then it's all exactly the same, you know, like this big revolutionary change. Mm-hmm. And you know, everyone's just in the pub as normal. And yeah, but there was no, I, I don't know what I was gonna say there, but yeah, that that change again was very very sudden but I think that's what that's what I was going to say I think people were just grateful that like they had that five minute lull of like oh well that that's over now thank god that's over not thinking at all like no it's not over it's just started and it will now never be over yeah yeah we're (laughs) it forever now I find it really interesting I've been been watching um when I'm in between binge watches I know this is really sad but I don't care it's true fact about myself I watch old goggle box (laughs) I love goggle box But there's something really great about watching all Gogglebox because mm. you're kind of reminded of that time and, and the, the mm. series I'm in at the minute is mm. the whole thing about um, uh, Article, was it Article 50? Article 50? Like, yeah. like the, you know, yeah, kicking yeah. it off and Theresa yeah. May. And I find it, I, 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 I find myself shouting at you sometimes because they'll be on about like how bad things are. Like, you've mm. got no idea. Like, it's going to get worse. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, and then there was the whole, like, um, Trump, um being made a uh, president and it's a really it's really interesting to watch back and and again it's just so aggravating when you see the rhetoric that are coming out of politicians mm. and Nigel mm. Farage and um and then like like how it took so long afterwards and how I don't know like I just feel like watching it you're like oh my god yeah that was awful that was an awful mm. time mm. horrible for everybody and then also but, but better than now yeah exactly. <laughs> like, like we thought that was the end of day like, yeah that was really awful yeah but it was it was it was better it, 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 it wasn't as bad as the global pandemic that's coming 
so yeah but on the work front what's it done has it like have you had big losses in staff has it changed I mean obviously there's there's been as you say COVID and there's been austerity that's probably been a bigger long-term effect on yeah I think I think it did affect a lot of people but just not it didn't it particularly impinge on my role and the things that I do but I mean the university does a lot of scientific research that's where it makes most of its mm. money and um you know there were a lot of people who were research scientists who ended up having to leave and I remember a colleague telling me that um she did more work in research and telling me that um she never thought about the repercussions on individuals and the day after the vote um result this researcher came in and was just in floods of tears and and felt like the whole country didn't want her there and mm. it made my colleague feel really bad because she'd never mm. she'd she felt like she was making this decision on I don't know kind of like you know weighing up rational basis yes. yeah but hadn't actually thought about the impact on individuals and mm. it made it, I think you know it made her think about that that day telling that isn't it <laughs> yeah and I think and I think a lot of people felt like that. And then also somebody was telling me a story about being in Middleton Park the day after the vote and meeting um, some people, I think they were Polish, and sort of saying, oh, you know, I felt horrible about the Brexit thing. And they were like, oh, no, we we, vote, we voted for it. And, oh, it was yeah. like, I was like, and he was like, really? And they were like, they were like well, yeah, because it's, this is a small country and, you know, there's not enough room for everyone. It's like, oh, my God. Like, yeah. I mean, obviously, naively, I would have assumed that people wanted to keep it open, but... Some yeah. people think, well, I'm here now. No, there, was, there was big support. There's a lot of hatred for the EU for very good reasons. And, and like, you know, but there's the, lots of benefits from it. I mean, the, the thing, it, it's the irrationality of it. I mean, well, ultimately, the thing that really, really annoys me about it is it's just an absolutely made up thing that has just ruined lives. Um, you know, like it, this was not something anyone even really gave a crap about before. There were the no. odd people who were like really, really anti-EU. No. But the, there was no like, you know, most people were sort of, oh, yeah, there's some benefits. There's some things that I find annoying, but I'm not, you know, like it's yeah. there. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, you, you just accept the world as it is kind of thing. Um, but yeah, they're like introducing it as a topic and then, then it's just like. Yeah. And, and, I, and I really didn't like the way, um, I mean, I suppose it's been happening forever, but it really felt like it was divisive. Yeah, it was. And, and I think deliberately so. Yeah, I felt like it was deliberate. And mm. and that's, that's horrible, isn't it? You know what I mean? Mm. Like, you know, falling out with people over your beliefs and things. Well, it, it's the Jay Gould thing of like, you can always pay half the working class to kill the other half. <laughs> yeah it's just yeah so from a work perspective I'm sure there are things that it did affect um but it didn't really it didn't really come into my working life what um, about supply issues and stuff sort of last year did you oh. uh well th this is the thing because, because your job's so sort of compartmentalized I don't I don't mm. deal with anything like that but I yeah. mean I'm sure I'm sure it did have an impact because we used to we use this company. I think it's called Science Warehouse that you order yeah. things from, yeah. and I I imagine it did have an effect on prices and getting yeah. things and yeah. um you know like I I used to I don't know more but I used to subscribe to this thing during COVID called Scroll Box where you got sent like mm. a little box and it would have like some artistic um you know like different medium and then different papers mm. and little projects you could do and things that I used to do it with my mom um and there I remember them writing and you know you you were supposed to get one once a month and then it became delayed and then they would keep writing to you and saying you know we're trying our best but we're, we're wrapped up in all and every time we think we've got it sorted another thing happens or there's another mm. red tape thing and mm. you know so it was, it was quite clear that mm. it's very quickly uh, mm. it did have an impact for everybody mm. Which that that won't be over. I bet that's still ongoing. I think it's still and, ongoing, isn't it? Yeah. yeah but they they'll have just been able to sort of release some of the blockage. Uh, but it's, then it's, but then there's another lock coming. So then it'll get like massively worse again and stay worse. Exactly. But you know, it's ironic, isn't it? I mean, I know obviously everything has. You know, you're always going to have sort of teething problems at the beginning of of anything. But it's just it's so ironic that you know they kept saying, you know, we're going to cut down on the bureaucracy, mm. and it's like, well that's not like oh we're gonna, we're gonna be filling in last forms 
to mm, well it's always a lie whatever they say it's the opposite you know it's going to create yeah. jobs no it's going to make them go mm-hmm. you know i say it's going to like make the environment better no it's going to poison us all yeah um, and our rights become squashed yeah oh yeah you're going to get a new bill of rights Oh, oh wait, is that after you've ripped up all of them? And is that the one that's written by Dominic Raab, who's under investigation for serious bullying? Yeah, yeah. Like, great. And, uh, God knows what else. I mean, yeah, like, all these, yeah, nightmare. Um... <laughs> 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 Let's do climate change. Um, <laughs> like, all these happy questions, as I say. Uh, so, yeah, climate change in your work. I mean, from... Uh, let, let's because we kind of know what the university is doing I mean you're probably aware of like uh, I mean how do you think it how do you think it, it's it kind of stacks up in your role um from like obviously this is a subjective perspective but like how environmentally damaging do you think your role is and like where do you think you've alleviated things I think um, more out of the way things happened during lockdown than me making a concerted effort to be a better person. Um, like pre, pre-COVID, pre we would print a lot of material. So there'd mm. be like booklets for students to work through. And mm. they, I think they get given like print credits. And so we mm-hmm. would just try and take the onus off that. So if there's anything that, that we needed them to read beforehand, there was a yeah. lot of printing went on. and. Yeah. Um, I think we're already trying to work away from that, but it's quite yeah. difficult. Sometimes on a job, it can be really difficult to chit it because you, you ask yeah. all the question, why, why do we even do it like this? Oh, we just inherited that process. And, and yeah. quite often you're fighting fire a lot at work and you don't have time to sit back yeah. and think, what can we do to improve everything? Well, that's it. And there'll be two and three, two or three people who are there who are like, you know, whenever someone tries to change it, they'll be like, oh, how dare you? I'm going to see someone official and get this stopped. Yeah, yeah. And that's exactly. why nothing gets changed. Yeah. <laughs> and you but have I to think I think I think because like of COVID, everything is on everything's online now yeah. and um I don't print anything anymore. So mm. so just a little old me even. I mean I've I've probably mm. saved quite a few forests, but just you, just through not printing. Did, did you work remotely as well? So through I did work remotely, yeah. 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 And I really uh, well at first. I thought it was fantastic working at home. Um, but then you do get isolated. Um, mm. And so at the moment, I'm, well, I think it's still a trial that they're doing at university, but I think it'll last forever, to be honest. So we're doing hybrid working. So I do mm. two physical days in work and two days at home. And that's mm. the perfect amount for me because you get to see your colleagues. Mm-hmm. You know, as much as we've got teams and things like that, it's not the same as like, I don't know, being able to just turn on and go, do you remember what we did last year? It's mm-hmm. like just just so much easier um, mm-hmm. and just physically seeing people after being after not seeing anyone for such a long time is great. So, yeah, it's perfect for me. Mm. Um, but, yeah, uh, like the the environment and stuff. I, I mean, I think that helps. I mean, I, I live in Beeston and I really noticed the quality of air. <laughs> I hadn't noticed the bad quality of it. I knew about it, but I didn't feel like mm. I felt it. But mm. yeah, it didn't take long, you know, with no airplanes going over and Jewsbury Road being quiet, um, yeah. where it made such a huge difference. Yeah. Just felt, just, you just felt cleaner. Yeah, because there's hardly any trees going down Jewsbury Road, is there? It's, it's no. just like, it's just traffic. Just built up. Yeah. yeah, or like, like York Road, it's just like a vast expanse of, of, of asphalt you know tarmac and yeah you know few I, th- I think as well what it made what it made me realize is because obviously we're all privileged to some extent or most of us are um but you know and I don't generally think of myself as you know uber privileged or anything but just the fact that at the end of my street I've got cross flats park that runs the whole of Beeston Mm. just being able to have that outside mm. space mm. because I, because one of the things I noticed was because obviously I didn't realize because I used to leave the house before seven and I don't get home until usually after six I did not realize how noisy my street is like yeah because we, we live in back to back so we're all living cheek yep. by jowl yeah um, but there were points in summer where I was like I'm just gonna end up killing a neighbor like everyone's mm. so noisy I, mm. so then I just think Do you know what? I'm just gonna go sit in the park and you wouldn't you wouldn't even believe that you're in the middle of beast and like you know on rows and rows of back to backs because it's so mm. quiet and beautiful and calm and I just thought 
you know, when you think about people who are living in a high rise flat, mm-hmm. uh, who don't have any access to any green spaces, don't live near mm-hmm. a park and are stuck in mm-hmm. a house with children. Mm-hmm. You know, it made me, I think it made, me, it made you think about the, the disparity and, like, and also like, how lucky am I? I mean, I've done all sorts of crappy jobs through my life. Mm-hmm. How lucky am I in, at, at this point in time to be working for the University of Leeds and be in the position I was and be, you know, that could give me a laptop to work at home and, and mm. then, uh, and then one of my neighbours works at Sainsbury's, and so he mm. he he hasn't had any like he's just had to work as normal through the entire thing. Mm-hmm. And I thought it was it was it really showed up the disparity between you know like everyone was loving people delivering you food and mm. all of these jobs that were seen as kind of I don't know kind of like low scale like not as important as other people's mm. jobs. Turns out <laughs> those people kept everything going. You know what I mean? Mm. I, I don't know how much any of that it doesn't feel like any of that's kind of trickled on in normal times but it really made me think about you know it must have been really awful you know when everyone else has like got time off from work and you know is is staying at home and then your life is exactly the same except you can't go to a pub and socialize and see your family that must Mm. have been Mm. horrible Mm. Mm. well it, it you know like with anything it's sort of good and bad isn't it and then it's which way the scales go for you mm-hmm. um because I'm sure plenty of people who work were working through the pandemic were kind of like oh my god it was bliss I could get to work so quick yeah. like I didn't have to deal with loads of customers all in one go they were all nicely queued up outside and we could yeah. make them wait and we could send them out if they weren't wearing a mask and yeah. great yeah <laughs> those were the days I'm sure there'll be at least one person oh yeah I'm, that I'm, was I'm, their sure, I'm sure yeah but it's also like um I felt really guilty because uh I mean, obviously, there was bits of it that I didn't enjoy, and there were parts of it that were hard. But in general, I really enjoyed lockdown. Mm. It gave me a chance to work through loads of stuff that had been going on in my life that I hadn't had time to sort of think about. Mm. Um, you know, I had time to be creative. Uh, I did some volunteering work that I found really, um, I don't know, like soul nourishing. Mm. Um, I don't know, and it just, and, and also. Um, so I split up from like a really long term relationship in the January, you know, and people are like, oh, yeah. 2020 is going to be a new life for me. Like, life is just like, ha ha. <laughs> you know I mean, you've been in this long term relationship. You're like, uh, freedom. And, and you may be Get ready to move that. on, but hold on, there's a global <laughs> pandemic. So that's not going to happen. Um, but I actually think that was really useful as well because um, it gave me a, like a long period to reflect. And yeah, reflect and to sit with it and not just yeah. like go, oh, I'm going to forget about that and just go out. Yeah, and also yeah. Um, I didn't get formal because everybody was in the same position. Yeah, yeah, but From yeah. a selfish point yeah. of view, do you know I mean, it was, it was like, it's not just me sitting and being bored. Like yeah. the whole world are in the same position. Yeah, yeah, that was, so, yeah. That was kind of a big thing for me because it was kind of, I, you know, I'd been sitting around spending most of my time indoors stuck looking at the internet um and then it was like oh everyone's doing the same thing oh well I don't feel so bad about it now yeah yeah, exactly (laughs) and also at the beginning I mean obviously I feel so terrible for everybody whose lives have been affected negatively by it of course but at the beginning like when we didn't know exactly what was going to happen it just felt really like I like a bit of mayhem every now and then like Mm. something crazy to happen do you know what I mean and Mm. It seemed like the most crazy thing. And then, like, um, I can't remember who it was. Somebody was telling me that, like, a younger person had said to them, well, what did you – how did it all work out last time this happened? And they're like, this has never happened. Like, this is, like, mm. the first time for everybody. Mm. There was something really, like – I just couldn't even believe it because my niece was living with me at the time. And when we got locked down, I was like, this is mental. This is yeah. mental that this is happening. Yeah. yeah. And that that sort of – no matter whether you were locked down or not like not locked down like that is pretty much it's as universal experience as you will get other than being alive you know it's like oh everyone that's here now went through that apart from you know the people who've turned up just recently yeah um but yeah it's uh unprecedented and and like the effects of it wouldn't it, we don't know you that's know, what like I think and it's, and it's still ongoing and all exactly. of this kind of stuff but all of this like as much as the politics has been fomenting over the past few years a lot of this is just driven by um by covid of just like the amount of people who had time to sit at home reflect spend time on themselves uh or or just dealing 
with horror but like in extraordinary circumstances and yeah that, that's that's been a life-changing period for so many people even the, just the people that just sat at home absolutely and I think I think that it's a bit like what I was saying about the internet earlier we're not we're not in a position to be able to look back and yeah. analyze what happened and and what it did like we're still in it and, and one of the weird things is that is that it really feels like it went from because I started a whole series on the podcast called coronavirus I think it's called bloody bloody coronavirus episode yeah, yeah. <laughs> um and um I lost my thought now oh yeah it, what was really difficult was to decide when to stop when to stop that series mm. because because there was no clear delineated end mm. like oh we're all out of lockdown oh mm. it's like you know because there, there was a bit of a thing that like, oh yeah it's gonna be the summer of love and all that crap mm. but it never was because there was mm. there was no sort of defined it wasn't like here's the line and yeah the it was like the big again, announcement and now we're all free um mm. you know and just it hanging around i mean work wise was it i think it was one of the weird things is that all, I mean, I'm crap at remembering years anyway, but everything sort of rolls into one. But last mm. Christmas, we have, so we have these big medical exams, but we do like a mock one for year three, so that, that I've never done an exam like that before. And it's very daunting. So we tried to put a mock on for them. And I remember them telling me about this in September and it was going to happen in December now. And, 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 and bearing in mind this happens at the LGI, mm. I was thinking, I it, because I know how much work as well it takes to, to organise it, I was thinking... Mm. This is ridiculous. Oh, it wasn't last Christmas, it was the Christmas before. Um, I was thinking, this is ridiculous. This will not go ahead mm. because it's not over. And yeah, because we it, went into another lockdown then, didn't we? Yeah, and, and winter, you know, winter is a period where the mm-hmm. NHS are under huge stress anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, it ended up, it was when Omnicron was the thing. So so yep. I ended up being off work anyway over that period. And when I came back, I thought, oh, I wonder if that exam took place. And, and it got cancelled the day before, which I felt mm. really bad for the students about because they put a lot of work into revising. And also they've mm. been under, so, I mean, some of the students... I felt so bad for them because you go to university to have, it's not just about learning, let's face it. It's about mm. socialising mm. and, you know, having a great time in a new city with your friends mm. and like learning about yourself and life. And the, 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 and so they're still paying all this money. All of their lessons are online, not even face-to-face. Mm. And then they're not even allowed out of their flats and mm. they couldn't, I, I just think, I, I felt really, really bad for students. And and we are still feeling the repercussions of that now mm, with students mm. who are not as confident. The, a lot of them have never sat an official exam because everybody mm. had to kind of wave through to keep the system moving. Mm-hmm. Yeah, horrific, horrific for kids, I thought it was. Mm. 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 Um, I'm just thinking whether we want to do anything climb out uh, because I, I know we've got back to oh, COVID yeah. and, and we're on climate change but um yeah from the podcast side I mean you have you what have you found in the city from the podcast in terms of because there's there's a lot more like I knew there was good stuff going on in Leeds and so on but it feels like there's a hell of a lot more going on than I you know that I've barely scratched the surface of um yeah. like what have you what are you kind of finding because are you quite deliberate in how you've picked people or has no. it been a bit of a lottery as well as no, just just organic really it's just like whoever I get in touch with or whoever gets back to me sometimes it might be even in the same kind of arena but mm. whoever whoever gets back to me first is the person that I'll go with kind of thing and I've just kind of it's just sort of been organic really the way that things have worked but I think that probably probably Leeds 2023 has um, helped grow people doing projects and things like that. But I think I think that what it is is I think all of that stuff is already there and exists. It's just that once you start looking, you mm. find more and more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like a guest will say, oh, "Have you ever spoken to so and so?" They do this. Yeah. Yeah, and then you know, like, and like you only have to spend a little bit of time on Twitter and looking at a hashtag leads, and there's so many mm-hmm. things, like so mm-hmm. many great things. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm really glad that I, I feel I feel like the, if you look at the range of episodes I've got, it's so eclectic, and I and I love. I feel like that is that it reflects the strength. It reflects leads, like the, yeah. the, this is how many in different arenas. Like today, I spoke to. 
um, the woman who runs Leeds Gothica Festival, which was fascinating. Mm. And like, just because of the conversation with her, I always make notes when I'm doing podcasts. I've got like so many things to chase up because of the things that she told me about. And mm. I think it kind of works organically. But yeah, I just think, I think genuinely, I don't, and I'm pretty sure it's probably like this in most cities. Um, but yeah, genuinely, there's just so many great things. And then I saw, I can't remember, this must have been on Twitter. And I thought, what a great idea. I just, I'm endlessly fascinated by how amazingly creative people are. And um, it was a young lad, oh, it's on Reddit, a young lad who started, um, so it's like making music on electronic mm. things, you know, like, and then they just go and play, like, they make music together and then they play their MP3s and things that they've made. And I was like, again, that's fantastic. Mm. Like, every time you think you might have heard it all, you haven't, because there's just... Mm. You know, it's as wide as people and people's interests, I suppose. Mm. Yeah, I do think, I don't think it's just that Leeds is a particularly creative city, although it is. I think that in general, it's like um, I used to love Grace and Perry's art club during lockdown. Mm. That's fascinating to see that when people have got a little bit of time and they're kind of given the freedom to do it, they mm. will find, they'll find something to do, something mm. interesting. But yeah, I think I think in general people are really creative and people have got a lot of potential. Mm. And maybe if you live in the kind of city, you know, like we've got so many great things like Leeds Inspired, the libraries do so many fantastic things. You know, mm. you've got Light Night. Um, yeah, I feel like it's the. I think it's it feels like a very conducive city to being creative. Mm-hmm. You've got the art college. You've got. Um... Northern School of Film and Television. Yeah. Got Channel 4 here now. Yeah, the Conservatoire. Um, yeah. This and then I heard great. EMI Records are opening a branch yep. here, which yep. is amazing. And the British Library are going to come to that yep. beautiful old mill building. And then, you know, um, Sam Armitage wants to open the Poetry Centre in Leeds. Mm. It's just, yeah, I feel, I feel like it's great because it feels like, you know, the North can feel neglected a lot, can't it? You know what I mean? And it feels well, like... it is. It literally yeah. is. And we, and we get, a, like, the, you know, a bad deal in general. Yeah. But yeah well, we just, got, we just got blown out for all the levelling up money, didn't we? Yeah, levelling up. I mean, God, why would you <laughs> need to have that phrase? Uh, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a better way of saying, oh, we'll give you a bribe, maybe. Yeah, it's like it's like it's like here's some money. Sorry for forgetting you for decades. Sorry for my oh, that, sorry, we sorry forgot. for my Thatcher, everyone. <laughs> but yeah, I do think Leeds is a really. But I, I just think people in general are fa- fascinating. Okay, so we'll do the change question. So if you could change anything about your work, you change any three things about your work right now, and you can think about this for both both roles. That's if you consider the podcast work, but you've said it's kind of hobby. So, um, yeah, how what would what, what would you change about your work if you could change any three things? Um, I mean, my university work, I would like to be paid correctly. So I don't want to say too much about it because I don't want to get sacked. <laughs> but yeah. um, I mean, there's, there's lots of great things about work at the university, but there's also some rubbish things. And I mean, everybody knows about all of the strikes that are happening and the sort of mm. civil unrest about everything. Um, yeah, that would be really nice. Um, and one of the things that I find frustrating, and I think this is partly to do with, so there's the University of Leeds, and obviously they have institutes and things within them, and and we are the medical school, mm. and the university, and I get why the university likes to try and homogenise everything, so everything mm. works the same, which I mean, mm. which I get. However, the medical school is different. Mm. because we are creating people who are going to have people's lives in their hands Mm. and there's quite often where the university will try and implement things onto the medical school that I feel are not appropriate because of because of the nature of it not just because you know I'm not just being precious because I work in the school of medicine and health Mm. and I think that that's I think that's valid like for example so you mean like it's literally like this this is actually this uh, the effect of this is it's literally going to cost lives yeah is that the kind of thing yeah yeah so for example if a student lied or plagiarized in i don't know history for example mm. i mean yeah that's bad and it goes against academic processes but the implications mm. of having a lying hist- history student to the implications of having a lying medical student i mm. think are completely different mm. like I, obviously there'll be the argument well everyone should get treated the same but it's not the same i don't think no, and well, and I, no, and the world's not flat. 
you know and yeah. it's not everything's not the same you no. know things are everything isn't the same discreet. yeah yeah um, and the other thing that I'll change is, and this is kind of partly linked, quite often often they'll, they'll I don't know even know who they are, and I'm just like talking about a shadowy cabal, <laughs> they will implement a system, mm-hmm. for example, and not ask anybody on the ground, mm-hmm. what do you need out of the system? Mm. what what you know how what is it that you what what do you use it for mm. what would be what would be most beneficial for you what what's mm. the way we can implement this in an easy smooth transition that's not mm. what happens mm. <laughs> they, they just go right we're taking the system away and i have this system and then you you'll start to use it and find that it's just not mm. appropriate for the work that you do mm. Mm. i find that i mean i'm sure that happens in sort of big institutions and corporations all over but yeah I find that really like I, ju- I just think it's so short-sighted whether you look at that uh or the the sort of Silicon Valley stuff that Cameron was on about and the you know like the the old um, uh old street roundabout that's Silicon whatever Silicon roundabout and it's it's a nothing it's a, it's like oh I want this I'm gonna throw some money at it and it, and and it will magically appear it's like no you know like yeah you can nurture things and incubate things and yeah. invest into things mm-hmm. but you can't just go like oh I want this thing you know and there it's normally people who are kind of like they've got a big idea and then they want to like flash in the pan onto something else it's yeah. like when I implemented this system over here it's like yeah. well, did it work no yeah. <laughs> yeah I think I think it totally is that and I think um and then what happens is you sort of get tired you can be tired of the brush of like not wanting change or like being fearful of change yeah. it, it's not it's not I'm not against things changing as long as yeah. they improve you know what I mean but if things ch- first of all there's no point in trying to fix something if it's not broke and second yeah. of all you should always be looking at what is the end what's the end game here what what do we want from this well and also it should be user led of like who are the people that are doing this mm-hmm. what do they think because they know yeah. <laughs> because they do it yeah and then and then and then what often happens is I'm, I'm sure it's more complicated than I'm making out and the people who do these things will perhaps have better arguments but it kind of feels like so that so the university will buy into a product or a contract for for however long and it'll cost you know hundreds of thousands of pounds mm. And 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 then they find out the system doesn't work, and then and then it's like, well, we can't get rid of the system because we because we've bought in for three years, and, and mm. now we've realised that there's certain things we can't change, and mm. it's a bit, it feels backwards to me. Like, why would mm. you have bought the thing first, mm. and then worked out that it doesn't do the things that you need it to do, or what the yeah. people said it did, yeah, because they didn't really understand what it is that you wanted, yeah, yeah, mm. seems topsy turvy to me, yeah. Yeah. And then people wonder why like public sector contracts are kind of like, oh, why is this thing that's been delivered a load of rubbish? It's like because the tendering process makes it like that. Yeah. Because it's like you give in all the power because obviously you can't have any say because you don't know what you're talking about or what you want. (laughs) So it has to be given to you by someone who's decided whatever's correct. And it's like they've decided in some room miles away. And then they don't care anyway because they've got (laughs) another job somewhere else. So they'll never have to deal with the consequences of that anyway. Yeah. Like the worst they'll get is a piece of paper or a report saying this thing's not working. And then they'll go write on it and go, make it work then. (laughs) (laughs) That's that's my input. (laughs) Let's not look at it. (laughs) Yeah, but I think um, in terms of the podcast, I don't think there's anything I would change. I'm quite happy with the way things work. I enjoy doing it. So, yeah, I think I've I've got more issues with my paid job (laughs) Mm. than I have with my non-paid job. You know, by the sounds of it, it's not it's not the the job itself. It's just the condition, which is not particular to your employer, as we can see. No, absolutely. Yeah. And, and and you know, I'm in a really interesting. It's an interesting role because, you know, I'm representing the University of Leeds, but we work really closely with people in the NHS, and that's mm. Mm. fascinating. And I felt like I had a better handle on what was going on COVID wise, just because. I work with people who were on the front line. Mm. So I I felt like I didn't have to so much rely on, because that was another thing that was really awful during COVID. I found that I paid far too much attention to the news, you know, because like the briefings and things like that, 
and I found that was really bad for my mental health. And at one point mm. I had to get rid mm-hmm. of news apps and make a conscious effort not to continually watch the news mm-hmm. because it's hard, isn't it? Because on the one hand, you think to yourself, well, I've got a responsibility as a human being to care and know about what's going on in the world, but the but nature that's not of all the news and things. And, yeah, and also, that's not it. Yeah, and you're not, you're not really helping anyone, are you, by... No, you, you're just being given an agenda of like, this is what you should think about. You know, it's like one of the things I remember from my media studies is like, it's not it's not that the media tells you what to think, but it agenda sets. It tells you what to think about. Yeah, So it's exactly. not like, you know, it's like, think about Brexit. I don't want to think about Brexit. I've got other things to, no, think about Brexit. Yeah. It's like, okay, what about Brexit? <laughs> Yeah. And it's like, then your time's been wasted on their project rather than yours. You exactly. And, and it's a bit like um, this whole, all of the fallout about uh, Prince Harry and all that stuff. It's like, you, you might not have an opinion about it or care about it, but you, you've you actually got no chance of avoiding that because mm-hmm. you listen to Radio 4, someone's talking about it on there. You look at the newspaper, you watch something on TV. It's, it's insidious, isn't it? So even mm-hmm. if you wanted to avoid something, in mm. in many you'd have to be like a hermit really and or they just... put it on tv in bloody banks and stuff yeah you know like you go into you go into shops or pubs and they've got it on the tv there it's like, yeah we've turn got, it we've off got, i don't want got, this we've got tvs and that we have like a in the worst building where i work there's a big sort yeah. of uh, area called the airport lounge and there's big tv and, they the walls and rolling rolling news, news. Yeah. yeah so, so it, you, you're just walking just to get propaganda. a coffee <laughs> yeah yeah it's just constant constant it's so, so i think, I think it, you have to kind of temper it, don't you? You have to temper mm. what it is that you receive. And mm. it's a bit like doom scrolling. You know, you have to realise that all you're doing is sat there like, you know what I mean? And then just think, oh, do you know what? And it's really difficult. Me and my son have been talking about it recently because we're both into politics and we, we like care about the world and stuff. Mm. And we'll dissect things together. And sometimes you just have to say to yourself that people have always thought it was the end of days for mm. a start. Like since things were ever written, people thought, "Oh, this is the end." Or like, you know, this kids guy's today, like, our heads. Yeah, like, oh my god, you know what I mean? Um, people have always thought that, and also, it's kind of like it might sound like a, a bit kind of like a hippy dippy sort of thing to say, but really, you have to appreciate the small things and the free things, and the things that no one can take away from you, like spending time with friends, or mm. you mm. know, going to the art gallery, or mm. engaging in I don't know. A piece of art that you're never going to show anyone because it doesn't matter it's not about that it's just about enjoying the process and mm. kind of being in the flow and that kind of thing and yeah and I feel like sometimes you have to remind yourself that there is actually beauty everywhere and you know things are amazing and we're in a a good place compared to where we might have been historically it doesn't mean that you shouldn't ever be striving for things to be better but occasionally you have to just close in on little things be micro rather than macro i think it's a balance it's, well it's uh you know when people's talking about switching off metaphorically it's, it's also switching off literally it's like turn it off look out the window what's happening yeah. out there like listen to the street is it are the people running along the street on fire yet like <laughs> no okay so we're not that bad yet yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> we're not That's quite it. in the 70s because the because the uh grave diggers haven't gone on strike yet yeah <laughs> yeah oh they will uh yeah yeah so that's so have you got any more potential changes then it's just like it would be nice to get paid a bit more pretty much yeah yeah, yeah really prices are yeah. cheaper yeah I, I, i'll tell you what else um, i mean there is something i can do about this and i am making a, a positive effort because of the nature of my role I quite often only see students when they are struggling Mm -hmm. or not doing so well Mm -hmm. or somebody's reported that they're not doing what Mm -hmm. they should be doing, Mm -hmm. which are all negative things. And it can Mm -hmm. give you a skewed idea because really I would say 98 to 99% of those students, if if I've never heard of Yeah, you're seeing a minority, yeah. If somebody says to me, have you ever heard of the student? And I say, no, that's a good sign. Because mm. if if I have heard of your name, it won't be usually to do with anything positive, mm. which seems a real shame to me that, because mm. I understand that obviously there's a cohort of people who need help and, mm. you know, and that's partly my role, but it feels unfair to me that the rest of them who are doing great and just get on with it, and they're mm. not need help from anyone, they're just yeah. getting through their life. Yeah. It feels bad that you don't kind of get... They're represented by 
the minority <laughs> that yeah. you see. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, but... So you're like, all students are like this because this is my direct experience. But yeah. then you have to contextualize it of like, but I'm only seeing a tiny minority of them because. Yeah, exactly. But there are things I can do to change that and I'm working on that. So we're going to start up some, we've done them before in the past, but then because of COVID things stopped. Because we ask them for feedback all the time. And I think they get, I think they get um, feedback sickness. People are sick. Because on the one hand, yeah, it's great to get feedback from people, but sometimes mm. it's pointless. You mm. know what I mean? Like sometimes you get a tutor go, oh, you know, the, the, you know, the student says something really bad about this lecture. I'm like, yeah, but the other one said the exact opposite. So that mm. just cancels each other out. Mm. I mean, that person mm. was totally positive. That person was totally negative. Therefore, it doesn't count. Um, yeah. But we're going to do some informal feedback sessions where we'll feed them pizza, free pizza, which they will love. And uh, yeah, and that and that will be better because it's more like it won't be kind of targeted. It'll just be like, in general, how are you doing? Is there anything like, you know, I found out once I used to wonder why I used to get on my nerves if they didn't reply to emails that are really important. Yeah. And, um, and then I found out. What's going to be me doing my job? Yeah, but then I found out that there were, you know, just through one of these informal feedback sessions, I found out that that they are part of all of these. As soon as they start university, they get yeah. put on all of these mailing lists, and yeah. like actually, the the volume of emails that they receive, yeah. it's it's understandable that occasionally they're going to miss gonna an email them, from yeah. someone asking them to do something by yeah. a certain date. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there, and also we stopped graduation ceremonies for a while because of COVID and I could get involved in those. And that is nice to be mm. like, be sat in the grand hall and you get to wear like a special gown and stuff and mm. watch them actually graduate is a nice mm. thing because, because you're like, then you can feel like, Oh, well I was, you know, only a small part, but I was a part of that process. You yeah, know? And then it's yeah. really nice to see and all the parents come in and being so proud and they're having the photographs yeah. taken and stuff. And everyone that's gets dressed up and, you know, yeah. they're, they're having a bit of a celebration. Yeah, that's nice to get involved in. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that is something I can change about my job and, I'm, and I am doing just because I just want to feel, I just want to feel positive about people. Mm. Do you think, I mean, you, you, you know, you've got the four days, but you're doing compressed hours sort of things. So, like, would it be a bit nicer to kind of have some of those out? I don't want to put this in a way that it could be construed wrong by anyone hearing it. But like, if you had less hours, would that would that be better? Or do you think you've got it? I oh, mean, you no, said you've yeah. got it right, but yeah. Yeah, less hours would be better. It's a bit of a difficult one, my role, because you can go through periods where there's not so much to do. Mm. Um, but then there are periods where things are just crazy, just because of like exam boards and the way things mm. work and... Um, where everything kind of bunches up. So quite often people will say, yeah. oh, it must be really nice, it must be really quiet in the summer. Well, uh, no, because the no, summer you're just is... catching up on everything that you couldn't get done through the year. It, well, yeah, there is that. But then but then also it's during that time where you're going to hear who who passed the exam in the year below, who you're going to be getting coming to you. You'll yeah. have a new cohort of students yeah. from um, like an international school that you have mm. to think about. Then you have to think about like the bookings of the rooms for the years ahead like you're looking at mm. you're looking at spreadsheets from years in the future because we need to be thinking about there's going to be more mm. students and where we're going to put them all which is another mm. drives me nuts that the government keep going oh yeah why don't you all take my medical students are you going to place them because i can't the, the, there are no spaces left for any more students mm. like i get it i get that you're trying to up it but yeah that's crazy a uh, wizard will fix it <laughs> Yeah, it's just like it's just to go. We're gonna have more doctors, but they don't think yeah. about like actually how does that happen? Mm. You know, we get a lot of students who are already complain. I don't that. know. My staff take care of that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just build another hospital. Yeah, we built for it. No, you didn't. You know, you said you would. No, it like, turned out like you were just giving said. everyone a little bit money for a porter <laughs> cabin extra. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, 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 it would be nice to work uh, fewer hours. It, it would be nice to be able to work fewer hours when it was necessary. Mm. I, I suppose it kind of what it is is it's kind of a line. Like for me personally, I really I like to be good at my job, and mm. like I'm I'm not the kind of person like I will knock off early if I think I've done everything and there's nothing else yeah, to do. Yeah, I'm not yeah. hang around for nothing, but yeah. I'm available if anybody yeah. needs me. You know what I mean? And yeah. um, it would be nice if people could be more like not assume that everybody's swinging the lead and looking for the easiest way out. Like if they could just, mm. if they could, my line manager is great at this, like she, cause she knows how everything works, you know what I mean? And so mm. it, 
it would be great if people could be trusted to be yeah there's a great level of suspicion all through it like seeded through everything yeah it's like you should be working every second of the day yeah and... there's always somewhere someone somewhere in the chain who's like but no oh they, they, we, we must expect this and then yeah. people watch on this and yeah yeah <laughs> everyone must be miserable <laughs> yeah it would be great if there was a little bit more sort of i mean there is, there is from my direct line manager um but yeah across university because i'm i'm pretty sure I'm, you know a, a bit like what i was saying with the students i'm sure there's a handful of people who are lazy and don't really care about being good at the job but in general I think most people you mm. no one wants to be wrong or like you know I just feel terrible if I've made a mistake I'll hold my hands up but you know you just you want to be good at your job don't you you want to you want mm. to do the best you can I think yeah. most people feel like that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I mean like you know when I was younger I couldn't really care about the job you know, because they, they weren't jobs I wanted to do, you know, it was, no. it was just like I had to get a job. So it was just do this, whatever. Um, but it's like, know, it's like that whole thing when when they say to you, um, you know, why do you want this job? Because I need to pay bills like there's my not... mum's making me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But it seems like such a disingenuous thing to ask somebody in an interview, you know, what I mean, because, yeah, yeah, you might want to work there because you think the company are great or the role sounds great. But in general, you just need because we all have to have jobs apparently to survive. Yeah. So it's just been, like, you know, it's kind of marketing egoism of just like, well, we're great. So uh, why should we have you? Yeah, why should we take you? <laughs> <laughs> People are queuing um, up outside to get in. <laughs> yeah, I've never got that, you, you know, the, this sort of you should be grateful for having a job. Why? Yeah. No. It's a two-way. It's not a reward. Yeah, it works both ways here. <laughs> um okay so we'll do ubi um I, I thought i would if i hadn't gone on that little detour i could have got all the questions in on time um <laughs> but yeah okay so let's add a ubi into the mix if you've got a universal basic income how do you think that would change things for you or would it just make things a bit easier i think it is a brilliant idea and i wish it was given more sort of um credence i think i think it seems to be building up doesn't it especially because there's a lot of people who were kind of rage quitting the jobs after COVID, mm. which I thought was mm. fascinating. Mm. Um, I think I think that for people in general, I think it would have a great benefit on the NHS because I think people wouldn't be as ill and be as stressed. Mm. Mm. And I think that um, you would have more scope to be creative, which is good for your mental health. You would have more scope to, like, say you had elder, elderly relatives, um, mm. you know, to be... And those are all things that have an economic cost yeah. aren't they yeah you know yeah. unpaid um, carers and yeah. like the stress and the the knock-on health effects of people trying to support people with health difficulties like you know my uncle passing the other year like my mum you know went through tremendous stress with that that was not like that obviously was from there but was exacerbated by yeah. having to deal with a collapsing system yeah um, yeah absolutely yeah. and you know I, I've heard horror stories where there was a lady that I knew and her husband had um terminal cancer and she got to the end of her you know like compassionate leave and things like that mm. and then eventually she, it was like you know, you won't get paid if you take time off with him but she mm. literally knew he was going to die in two months and I just mm. think what kind of world to live in where you have to make a decision between your job that keeps you going or going mm. on benefits to spend time with your partner who's going to die Mm. No. Or now it's like, well, now you have to come into work with COVID anyway. Just come yeah, in and give it to disgusting. everyone because we're we're so fine with it now. Yeah, yeah. So I think I think it would be fantastic. I think I would. I think I would still work. I mean, it depends. Maybe the idea of the nature of work would change because it wouldn't be so much about you'd you'd mm. be in a better position to choose anything that you'd be interested in doing rather than having to think about the economic benefits of it. Mm-hmm. Mm. So it would give you way more scope and to change about as well. It like, you know, like people end up staying in one career forever because it's safe. And mm. as you get older, you worry about, um, you know, how employable you are anymore to people. Mm. You know, people would be able to. And then surely you're going to settle into finding things that you really enjoy and are good at because, you, because you've mm. had the scope to better try a few different things. Well, and also, you know, if you're learning something new, if you're learning something, you're going to be crap at it you know like initially unless you you know you have a natural aptitude or whatever or you're yeah. you know amazing and brilliant 
but yeah like most of the time so anything new it's like okay well I've been a you know a doctor for 40 years and I'm going to be a postman and now I'm going to be an artist and, yeah. and it's like well you'll start off a bit rubbish at each of those you know um mm. and you'll learn things as you go and you'll change things and adapt things and yeah you know some discoveries will be by accident and some will be you know they'll kind of arise over time yeah. but yeah I think but we need that change we need the we need big change we need big change like yeah. on covid level kind of change big systemic change it's the, the thing is isn't it i suppose it's just the nature of politics in general but unless it benefits big business people are not you know you're not going to get parties getting behind it and it feels a little bit like like but then labor who the are the who are the big business i mean at the end of the day that's us Oh, I, 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 I completely understand. Yeah, I completely agree. And we, we need to cut them out and start talking directly to each other. Yeah, yeah, thing. yeah. It's get, it's getting there. Uh, it's getting people sort of mobilised behind it, isn't it? Mm. But yeah, I think we. I, I would, I would love to see huge changes like that. I think it would be really. It would just be such a great because it's been experimented in different places, hasn't mm. it? And the outcomes have always been pretty fantastic. Mm. And I think I read. I, I've been trying to get my head around economics because I was just like, money just seems like a ridiculous system. Mm. And it turns out it is, and I was right. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I'm sure in this book, somebody went to Nixon with this idea, mm. and it looked like it was going to get off the ground, and then mm. and then something happened. But it wasn't to do with the idea being bad. I think it was it, at the oil shock. Might have been, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's some. Can, but uh, can you imagine what a different world we'd be living in mm, if if they'd have started that project then. But we're we're dealing with like now what we're doing is so we we had like the limits to growth and stuff come out in the seventies, and you know you had Carter putting solar panels on the White House, and you had the oil shock and stuff, and then it's like we've reset to a degree. It's like you know all the powers in the Middle East is around oil, like you know and we just mortgaged our our future to have a spending splurge of imaginary money mm. <laughs> most of which all got hoovered up by you know one percent of the population and then yeah. we're kind of left holding the can going what happened mm. I mean I kind of feel like that when smartphones came out of like you know there was there was the crash and then sort of 2015 or whatever it was kind of like everyone looked up from their iPhones and went Oh, hang on, the world's on fire. <laughs> it got really mad. <laughs> and then we've been there since then. Yeah. <laughs> been distracted by kind of social media. Occupy, and then it kind of dropped off and you didn't really yeah. see anything and you'd had the tea party. And, but then it well, just. The, well, the other thing out. is, is that um, I was reading the other day and it, I think it was a book that was trying to make you feel better and sort of saying things are not as bad as you think they are and like giving you like concrete evidence of mm. things that have got better. Because it's good to have a balance, isn't it? Like, you just don't want to be like, mm. you know, I think it's good to be balanced about these things. But I think that the best kind of change has been gradual change. So when you think about the women on Green and Common, for example, you know, at, the, at that point, those women will not have thought that they were making any difference or any, mm. you know what I mean? They, they couldn't sort of see the end to it, but they did it anyway. And mm. then when you look at that trajectory through time, Mm. you know actually that had huge repercussions mm. that, that we are still benefiting from today not mm. completely but a lot a lot better than anyone would have ever imagined mm. and I think that's quite a nice so when you talk about like occupy or you know there's all sorts of there are all sorts of little grassroots things happening mm-hmm. that at the moment we we maybe uh, it feels like a drop in the ocean and that things mm-hmm. won't change but mm-hmm. You know, maybe when we look back, and if we're still all here, when we mm. look back in twenty years' time, we'll be able to say, "Oh, actually, th- you can see how that mm. worked through society, and that's where we are today, in a slightly better position, hopefully." Mm. But it, it's that thing for me. It's that thing. Like I agree with you, but you know, and then I look at, I, I'm caught between this, you know, sort of total apocalyptic oblivion kind of thing, and then like, you know, I'm. I'm quite strongly of the mind that we may have a military coup before the end of the decade. Like, really? But, you know, you don't know what's going to happen and you don't know what other things are going on and what, you know, what little good things are happening here, there and everywhere. 
But that's and I think they, the- I think they hide that as well, though, because they want you in this kind of despairing, not doing yeah. anything, yeah. keep watching the horror kind of thing. Yeah. Like just keep your eyes glued to the the parade of awfulness. Mm-hmm. Um, like don't go out and be active and and do something productive and constructive. Or don't do things with other people. Don't collaborate together unless it's in yeah. the way that we've approved of. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I think, but I think like. You know, none of us, none of us expected the global pandemic. Although some people should have done, arguably. Mm. Um, uh, and you know, when we talk about all of the things that have bad and good things that have come out of it that we can see so far, mm. this is kind of the thing, isn't it? Like we can't predict what's going to happen in the next ten or twenty years. Luckily, because mm. life would be pretty boring if you could, anyway. To be honest. Mm. So yeah, I, I'm the same as you. Like I, I veer between. I kind of hold two two things at the same time so partly it's well humans are a bunch of wasters anyway and who would care uh, and, and second of all I'm like but art is beautiful and charity is yeah. wonderful and people help mm. each other out every day and mm. I kind of I'm, I'm kind of I kind of hold the two things all the time but I mm. think it's probably important to do because if you despaired about everything and thought everything was just bleak forever then you'd never mm. do anything mm. and also the you know you can't go around with rose tinted spectacles and ignore all the shady shitty things that are happening in the world even mm. if there's nothing that you can do about them but then that's another thing you have to balance what mm. can i do like is there anything i can physically do or mm. you know how, how do i form my opinion on this that kind of thing so yeah but it's also like it, it's like what's the code, you know? Because for a long time the code was, you know, pick a pick a brand identity. You know, are you a skater or a, a goth or a punk or a like, you know, just buy your identity and express yourself through that kind of way. And you know, they would have, the cliques had their own codes of like what's expected. Yeah. And that's kind of disintegrated to a degree. I think it's it's kind of what's the code. Like, what's the, how how are we supposed to be? What is the right way to be a good citizen now? Like- I quite enjoy that, though. I, I think that's <laughs> really, I find that really good debate. Like, I really like, I really feel like in the last sort of five to 10 years, and, and, I'm, and I'm sure there are examples of the opposite of what I'm going to say, but it feels like people are embracing alternative ways of being. Mm. So, for example, when I was a kid, it, it was still slightly, um, still slightly kind of like a taboo thing. Like if you were born out of wedlock, that is not mm. a thing anymore. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And that's mm. within my lifetime. Mm. And, you know, just, you know, other sexualities or or mm. your pronouns. Mm. These are all difficult subjects and people can get, I mean, we've you can see from both sides that it can get very fraught. But I, but I think it's I think it's really interesting. We're living in a really interesting time mm. because we're kind of old school uh, values doesn't feel like the right kind of word, but I don't know. Things are being challenged, and I, mm. and I think that's really interesting. You know what I mean? Mm. And that and that people can op- openly talk about mental health, for example. Mm. You know, it wasn't that long ago where it would seem like a taboo thing to talk about, or people perhaps wouldn't discuss if they had, you know, mm. like a mental breakdown. Or and I feel like, you know, you get people go, oh, you know, uh, the whole snowflake argument. But actually, I, I don't know. I feel I feel like well, I feel like we're like not in every aspect of everything. But I do feel like we're there are some positive things that are coming out of the various issues we face. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think I've said this on the podcast before, but one of the things that surprised me sort of post Occupy and post the crash was that you had this whole like new sexual revolution. And it was like all the kids were into all of this sort of like gender fluidity and stuff, yeah. the kids. Um yeah. But it like it really sideswiped me because I was like, oh, you know, because I'm I'm post crash consuming all of this kind of literature about various kind of economic bits and bobs and what had happened here, there, and everywhere, and like you know, waving whatever flags, and then they come along with like a whole bunch of other flags, going, oh no, this, this, and I'm like, what? Not that, this, uh, this thing <laughs> here. I'm looking. At, what are you doing? This is confusing. And then actually, it's like. Actually, that's kind of genius. It is it's genius. like to come at it from a different angle because it's like, no, no, fr- the freedom. Yeah, and, and also I think I think there's a lot to be said about the things that constrain you as part of 
gender, living in a gendered world. Mm-hmm. And it's really fascinating to me to think about the use of pronouns. And like, uh, I think I read in a Tumblr, but it just blew my mind, really. I just never thought about it. So there was a girl on Tumblr and she did a blog and she was a farmer and I can't remember, it was some Scandinavian country, but I can't remember which one. But she was saying that she really struggles because there is no word in her language that is an ungendered thing of being a farmer. So when you Mm. say to someone, so the first question that always comes up is, oh, farmers are usually men because the word is so gendered to to male. Mm. Uh, And I I just thought that that is... In what context is that true? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, I, I just, I just think, I, I just think it's really interesting because people sometimes say, "Oh, well, it doesn't really matter. Language doesn't really matter." But it really does matter because oh, yeah. if you Massively. don't have a concept, if your yeah. language doesn't name a concept, does that concept exist? And mm. obviously, it does. But then, mm. how do the people who are that affects what what words do they use to yeah. convey that? I, yeah. I find that all fascinating, and I think um, I, I love the idea of gender fluidity. I think. I think if I'd have been born perhaps uh, in a later time, mm. it, it would have affected my life a lot more than it has. Mm. But I, mm. I just think I just think there's this great idea about um, challenging what it is to be, mm. you know, just because this is the way it's been done for generations mm. doesn't mean it's the way we have to do it forever. Yeah. It's like, why, why have you chosen to do that? Oh, well, it was a really good idea that came up at the time. Okay, well, what was the time like? Mm. Mm. And and the other thing of like, oh, traditions, traditions, traditions. It's like, well, what's a tradition? It's just something that you've done more than it, it's something you've done more than once. Mm. You know, you think of like, oh, well, every year we go to such and such pub at such and such time. It's a yeah. tradition. Yeah. Because we've done it for the last three years. Yeah. It's like that's all the tradition is. It's just yeah. something you've it's done. Just repetition of something. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's yeah. like, well, why do we need to keep doing it? Why do we need these people with these ridiculous grey wigs to be judges? Exactly. Like... And also when you, when you live in a country that, you know, um, has a monarchy and, you know, the whole system of the House of Lords and all of that kind of thing, mm. then actually the, the concept of tradition becomes much more dangerous. Because, well, that's it. because, it's, because it's the system it, yeah. that's been replicated is one that you, you're you never going to be allowed to be part of or make mm. any decisions. You're mm. just mm-hmm. swept along in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's what this is. It's it's kind of like, a, you know, it's Britain resisting being a modern country, not being a modern country. It's being pulled along, kicking and screaming into modernity. Like, well, from the elite level, at least, because, I mean, if you think of like the adoption of technology, Britain's always been a country that was like, you know, if it wasn't leading on the technology, then it was quick to adapt most of it because it's it's always, well, not always, but there's been a long history of seeing the benefit of technology. Mm -hmm. So, you know, consoles being the most obvious example to my sort of growing up brain but you know like I I was aware reading the the journalism of the time that it was a you know there was Japan America and Britain were the the main kind of adopters of these kind of things yeah and also I think I think Britain in general has an old way of looking at itself like like a weird nostalgia I don't know if that's to do with like getting older or something. And I've told my son if it gets to that point, you really got to like slap me in the face, you know, like where <laughs> where you think everything was better when you were younger, you yeah. know what I mean? And that whole yeah. yeah. And and also it's kind of like that was kind of like one of the problems with Brexit, wasn't it? Because it because I can remember thinking, well, well, what are we gonna sell to anyone? Like we haven't got we haven't mm. got anything, like we don't do mm. anything, mm. you know, and, and a lot of it is, you know, because <laughs> there's a lot of people who would like to make Britain a tax haven. So that them and their mates can continue mm. to screw everyone and, and not have to pay any tax. Mm. Um, that's not what you, you want to be standing for as a country, is it? Mm. Well, if the if the media can convince you that it is, then it is. <laughs> yeah, that's all right if you're rich, you know. If you're already rich, it's fine. Yeah, because you don't have to deal with any of it. But I mean, you know, it's I'm gonna stop there. Uh so <laughs> I'm I'm gonna like we're 15 minutes over. Um are you gonna dash off anywhere in any um, time? No. I, I would normally pass it over to you, but this has been so all over the place <laughs> as a normal <laughs> episode, and more of just a conversation. I mean, is there anything that you want to particularly kind of speak about? I'll, I'll definitely give you that opportunity. 
I think that everybody in the world should read more. Mm. I think, uh, I, I know it's like, it's completely off tangent, but yeah, I suppose if I could ask anyone to do anything, it would be, please just read more books. Mm. I can't believe how many people don't. And mm. I find it really annoying. I ain't got time. Like, well, Make you have time. got time. Everybody's yeah. got time. Yeah. Um, don't don't watch the TV show that you must watch and read. Don't get me wrong. Show. Like I love TV. I, I love yeah. TV. I watch. A but lot you of could it. just drop one show that you must watch. You yeah. Know, just like... don't play Candy Crush for half an hour today. Yeah. <laughs> and read for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think because I think that one of the great things about reading is that it's. I mean, I love films. Don't get me wrong. But it's so much more immersive because you're living mm. the life through the character, and also you you get to live a million lives that you that you would never you'd never come across. That you'd never learn about. I don't know someone living in a tribe in Canada in the 1930s, or mm. or you know. I just think, yeah. I wish. I think people would be kinder. Maybe they'd certainly be cleverer. They just read more. Yeah, and I think. It, it's the time thing as well it's it's sort of that back up to speed I don't know if this resonates with you but like coming out of lockdown I remember as we, as we started to open up properly do I had this sense of like what I've got to do like three things today I can't do three things <laughs> in a day oh <laughs> do, do you know what I mean it was like everything seemed like what this this, this and this and that. I I have to do all of these. It's too much. Um, did you get any of that kind of feeling? I, I, of like... I, not, not so much that, but kind of kind of similar. Um, what I found was that I think I always thought that I was outgoing, which I am, mm, mm. but I didn't realise how much of um, the opposite I also am, and that actually I really enjoyed the space. Yeah. Um, and what I found was um even meeting family or meeting up with friends or going out I found it absolutely I'd not noticed it before but I think it did happen before but I just never noticed it that it absolutely mm. exhausted me just having to be social when you've not been social for a long time like you wouldn't think you could lose those skills really it's oh, not that I lost the skills that, it's, it's that I realized that it takes it takes a lot of energy mm. to be sociable and I didn't mm. realize how much that took out of me Mm. until I'd had the gap during COVID and then going back into it. Not so much now. I'm better now because it feels like, you know, I've been going back to work two days a week. and, and You're back so in we... the swing and you practice. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. But at the beginning, yeah, I used to like, even just like going out for a night out with somebody, you know, and then coming home, I'd just be like, oh, my God, like I'm drained. Like that really tired me out, mm. which I didn't, I never noticed that before. But I think it, I think it did have an effect. I just hadn't I hadn't realized and I would have thought that for somebody like me being by myself for all that time would have been really difficult but actually I really enjoy being by myself and I like a bit of quiet time and I am quite I've got I'm, I feel really lucky that I have so many things that I'm interested in mm. it's very it's very rare occasion I'm a little bored I'm going to do but in general I'm never bored because I've got mm. so many things to do um, mm. and I think that's it makes you feel like I don't know I felt uh, proud of my survival skills mm. on my own. Okay, so let's do your socials. Let's do the big up for Light on Leeds. So if anyone who is listening to this hasn't listened to Light on Leeds, why, why, not? why not? Yeah, what are you playing at? There's other great Leeds I'm podcasts there for four out years. there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I would imagine that probably most of my listeners are people who listen to you already. So, yeah, so where do people find the podcast? Well, I have my own website, which I designed myself, mm. um, www.lightonleads.com. So you can go there, read a little blurb, there's a photograph, you can listen to the podcast through that. But apart from that, like literally anywhere that you ever, I think, I think I've got everything covered. Anywhere, mm. anywhere you would normally listen to a podcast, you can find Light on Leads. Mm. Are you on YouTube as well? No, I have, I did... Because I use Zencaster to record a podcast and I don't use video. Mm. Um, but I did experiment with a guest, I think it was back in like, I don't know, like autumn, um, mm. where I did video it with a, a view to working out how I would sort all that out. Because mm. my niece's boyfriend said to me, I only watch things on YouTube. 
So yeah. I was like, oh, well, maybe there's like a, no, maybe there's a swear that people yeah. are missing. But yeah. then if you try and put a podcast on YouTube, I think I've, I've heard that they're getting better and that they're developing some features that'll make our lives easier. Um, yeah. But I, I've heard that, uh, but yeah, if you try and, like I tried making like a reel with photographs so I could have that on, but it's complicated yeah, yeah. and it's fine yeah. for the time. Yeah. So uh, I do have my eye on YouTube, but I just haven't. I haven't summoned up the sort of stamina to yeah. look into it yet. But then it also, it's a bit daunting as well, I think. Like, I I feel, again, like I would potentially be exposing my guests to more risks of, like, you know, sort of just the general loons that are on YouTube. <laughs> well, yeah, there is that. I never thought of that. But also what I was considering was that I thought if I did find a way to do it, probably what I'd do is ask the guests what they prefer because actually what brought it into my head was so when I first started doing podcasts it was fine not to have, I think this the the thing I used at the time didn't have a video um capability anyway mm. and then all, obviously because as as COVID sort of progressed people got so used to using Teams and Zoom mm. that that everyone were, were less phased about having conversations like we are now where we can see yeah, each other yeah. And then I was interviewing Leeds Autism Services, SAS they're called, Special mm. Autism Services. And one of the, when I was doing like the thing at the beginning, like if you've got any questions, one of the guests said, he was a service user, said, you know, why can't I see you? Like I thought I would, and I, and of course, mm. I, then I felt really stupid because I was like, I should have asked this question because maybe mm. it would make it easier communication wise if they could see who it is that they're talking to. I and I was like, oh, that, I was like, that's a really good, um, yeah. that's a really good question. And I'm going to go away and have a think about that. Mm. Um, so I think maybe probably if I did go on to YouTube, it would be on a case by case basis. You know, would you, that's what I'm thinking, would you yeah. rather have video? Would you rather just yeah. do? Because for me personally, when I'm doing podcasts, I don't have video. I could, but I don't. And partly that's because I don't want to be distracted by looking at myself or at the person. Yeah, and, no, and also, while I'm t- I don't want them to think I'm not listening, but while they're talking, I'm making notes so that yeah. I'll remember. Whereas I feel like if you could see no, them and good. I'm just sat there scribbling, it's not conducive to, I don't know, having a good conversation, really. No, that's really smart. Um, yeah, like I, I'm, I went for, I wanted to have the video. I wanted to see people on the remote records because like I needed to read them to some degree like whatever cues I could have because especially when I didn't have the questions kind of fixed and and sort of set it was like am I am I taking them down the wrong track here are they bored are they like do they understand the question are they like so I needed those visual cues um but yeah it was interesting when when I did yours of just the sort of just the voice and kind of just being there um yeah. and sort of yeah it was an interesting experience and I did one I just did a record the other day where someone had their camera off um and I didn't I didn't bother asking them to put it on like it it, it seemed okay and I went through the whole thing um and it was fine I think it went okay you know but I didn't I didn't have that comfort blanket I suppose of but it's nice to see the person as well and sort of see what they look like and kind of yeah. like you know wave and so on um but yeah it's I it does I do feel like it makes my audio quality suffer because right. it's YouTube and because uh sorry because it's zoom and because because you got the video on you're using up more bandwidth so yeah. the audio quality can potentially be lesser but I think it turns out all right mostly yeah Um, I just I couldn't really see the point of I don't know why you would want I kind of felt like it's almost like taking it away from the definition of a podcast if you can watch a video of it yeah yeah Um, but then I thought well I suppose I mean there's only one he's the only person who's ever said it to me but like, but I know loads of people who will have YouTube on at work but they you know they won't always be watching the video so they'll be listening to it and it's like that's easier than going through to Spotify or iTunes. Yeah, and I and I just think if there's a if there's a little pocket of people who that would be beneficial for, then mm. I think it's I'm quite happy to do a little bit of extra work to make that happen. Mm. But and um, then someone could take one of you know you never know if someone's going to take whatever of yours and put it on YouTube or yeah so. yeah you don't know yeah so yeah it's something I'm thinking about in the future but 
I've got more, I've got other more pressing things that I'd rather be thinking about, but I've sort of kept it there thinking to myself, one day I'll have a little go at it and see what happens. But yeah, I'm, I'm not in a rush to do it really. I don't think, I don't think people are clamoring for it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um. Okay. I, do I want anything else on the recording? Do we want to do anything else? We've got the socials. Um. I think we've done everything. I'm going to press stop. Okay. I'm going to thank you on the recording as well, just in case we do <laughs> use it. So thank you very much for doing this, Hazel. It's been really nice uh, to speak to you again, and it's been really lovely to see you. Um, <laughs> well, thank uh, you. It's been it's it's a really nice opportunity actually to be the guest and not the interviewer. Yes, I'm wanting to do that. So I'm wanting to go back to my first guest, and I want them to give me my questions for my hundredth recording uh, or well idea. interview. When will you be hitting that? Do you think? Oh, so I've got 17 more people to get and and they all have to approve their interviews being used so um I don't think probably April if I'm lucky wow that's a lot that's a lot to get in though mm. Mm. I tried doing the two a week um I've tried that for it. it's just too much it's too much work yeah, much, especially yeah. for, for nothing like if I if I can get the if I can get it actually making something then I'd be happy to do like it, I would be happy to do this full time and do it properly but the thing is it needs funding to do that like it oh. needs actual money and um so yeah I, I it's figuring out how to get there yeah I mean I, I've looked at funding before and I've had people like help me and give me advice and stuff and it's just so faffy and mm. and you know then it'll be like oh well we can't give you any money for it. like it has to be like a new project and it's like well I'm mm. already doing what I want to be doing like I don't mm. I, I don't know I just think I think I've just let the whole money side just think oh do you know what just don't worry about the money just just as long as I can continue I'm mm. quite happy you know I think so. you're going about it a whole better way <laughs> I've set myself up with all these arbitrary rules and arbitrary goals and stressing myself out about it. <laughs> yeah, but I think I think you know if 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 you are wanting to make money out of it, then it's always gonna have a little bit of stress attached to it, isn't it? It's just the mm. nature of things. And mm. I think part part of it is laziness for me. And part of it is I realise that if I don't make any money of it, I'm not beholden to anyone and I can stick yeah. to my own schedule yeah. and I don't. You know, occasionally I'll send something out and, you know, you must feel like this. Sometimes it feels like you're shouting into a void. And then occasionally you'll get a little bit of feedback. Like, oh, yeah, because I can see that clearly people, you know, I've got all different things. I can look at statistics. Yeah, someone's listening to it. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) I can see that. But, yeah, I think for me personally, I just don't think I would enjoy the whole thing as much if money was an, an issue with it. Yeah. But, like I said, if somebody wants to suddenly give me loads of money for doing it, I'll happily mm. accept it. <laughs> I mean, you never know. Like, I, I mean, it's one of those things that you kind of do. You know, it might be something that, say, you do it for, say, you just did it for another year and you were kind of like, mm, I've kind of had enough and wind it up. And then, say, another year down the line or whatever, someone that's listened to it is like, they find you and they're like, I think you're really good at this. I want you to do this for me. I'm going to pay you for it. And, you know, you never know that could turn up at the right time. Like, this is the beauty of life. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be good. I'll I'll leave that one up. Yeah, that would be nice. (laughs) Thank you again to Hazel for being my guest. Thanks again so much to all my guests for all their time and their patience with me. Thanks so much to Stanley for all his donations and support. I wouldn't still be doing this without it. And thanks also to those other people who have chucked in some cash, including, but not limited to, those fine few people who did join my Patreon. And finally, once again, thanks to you, Leeds, for being my subject. And you, listener, thank you to you for listening. Now, please, please can you take that next step? I need three more guests to reach the century, to get to 10%, in three years all on my own at great personal effort and expense, knocking on for 10k now. I will be able to record online again after the 20th of May. No thanks to most of you. I have just had an absolute hell month, which included but was in no way limited to having no bloody money or bloody work and having bloody COVID again. And I never want to go through any of that again. 
I will make appropriate adjustments when and where I can. But if you beautiful listeners can help this show, you have no idea how much assistance you will really be providing. This is a stupid Sisyphean task that I have set myself. That I can walk away from, sure. But I don't want to walk away from it. And plus, there's some really great guests coming up and I can't not put their episodes out. People have given me their time. So, if you have invested any time in this podcast, then I most graciously invite you to invest some small change. And I promise something will come out of that support. More can be achieved, if you will it. Working hours is here now. It's built. Come and walk around it and leave suggestion cards. Tell your friends you've been. You had the interview. You bought a membership in the Patreon shop. You sent a postcard and did an Insta story. Want it to be more professional? More sweary? Less sweary? There's too much climate? I'm not fair to Brexit? This show is what the guests make it, and anybody from Leeds or in Leeds can be on it. Anyone. I do want to hear a diversity of opinion because there's a lot of difference in this city, as there is in any city, but Leeds is best because I'm in it. Anyway, if we can get this show up on its feet, we're really going to have something special here, especially if you chip in. Notes are good. Artistic and bank. Postal orders will also be accepted. No blockchain, though. You can follow the show on Twitter at Working Hours 3 and on Instagram at Working Hours Pod Lead. Use the hashtag Working Hours Pod Leads to stay up to date on when new episodes are being released. DM me with your questions or most importantly to get in touch if you'd like to be my guest on this show. Not destroying your brain with social media? Then send me an email to workinghourspod at western-studios.com or if you'd like to be anonymous, email me at westernstudios at protonmail.com If you enjoyed this episode, please remember to share it with your networks. Please, please do chuck in anything you can to help Working Hours grow. Go to Kofi, that's ko-fi.com forward slash working hours and join me there for £3 a month. And or you can make any one-off donation of whatever amount through that site. Or you can go to patreon.com forward slash working hours pod to support Working Hours from as little as a pound a month. There's also an Outlander tier for non loiners at £5 a month and a £12 a month big time tier for anyone who feels flash. I'm not really offering anything much on the Patreon yet, as I'm already doing more than enough unpaid labour on this project. If and when things pick up, then we'll see. The goal is to make the podcast and my commitment to it both possible and sustainable. If you are happy to make a regular contribution, but you're priced out by a pound a month, you can go to librapay.com, that's L-I-B-E-R-A-P-A-Y, dot com, forward slash Western Studios, forward slash donate, and donate from as low as a penny a week, all the way up to £89 a week. And people say I'm pessimistic. Again, you can also make one-off donations through LibraPay, which you can do either publicly or anonymously. Remember to like, share, follow and subscribe to Working Hours. Work for peace and plan with kindness. Okay, that's me. Cheers, ears. Take care out there and be kind to each other, Leeds. Working Hours is produced, recorded, edited and published by Simon Treen for Western Studios Leeds Limited. The music was The Bees from Chopin's Etudes, which is in the public domain and was taken from museopen.org. Follow Western Studios Leads on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash western underscore studios underscore leads. And on LinkedIn, linkedin.com forward slash company forward slash western hyphen studios. Western Studios Leads will help you realize your podcast for only £25 for an hour of podcast work. Need podcast production, recording, editing or any podcast admin doing? Need it all doing? Do you want or need a podcast host or co-host for your podcast project? Then get in touch with Western Studios Leads Limited. 
email makemypodcast at western-studios.com to get your podcast made. Western Studios Leeds Limited is available to third sector organizations, small to medium sized businesses, and individuals to make podcasts or other digital audio content. Want to make some fundraising case studies? Want to show off your expertise in your field? Want some help creating your show and format? Or just some support learning to podcast and getting going? Whatever your podcast question or need, get in touch with Western Studios Leads. Go to western-studios.com and use the contact page to drop me a message about either working hours or about your own podcast project.